individual senators. The President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the peoples of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Senators, we meet today at the request of Senators Wong and Birmingham following consultation with other senators to consider a motion relating to the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the exception of His Majesty King Charles III. I call uh, the acting leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Thank you, Barrett. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion proposing uh, an address to uh, His Majesty King Charles uh, III. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Fowle. Thank you, uh, President. <coughs> I thank the Chamber. Uh, I move uh, that the following address uh, to His Majesty uh, the King be agreed to. Your Majesty, we, the members uh, of the Senate in the Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia, express our deepest sympathy with Your Majesty and members of the Royal Family for the great loss sustained in the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II our late sovereign. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell. Keep going. On behalf of the Australian people, we pay tribute to and acknowledge uh, Her Late Majesty's exceptional life and dedication to the duty and commitment to Australia and the Commonwealth. We extend our congratulations to Your Majesty on your accession to the throne. We express our respect uh, for Your Majesty and pledge uh, to work uh, to achieve peace and prosperity for Australia and the Commonwealth. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. <clears throat> the story goes that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth was having a conversation with an Indigenous elder from Queensland. He said to her, you are born and you walk on your country, you learn to live and to love and to do what you are born to do, and then you go home. President, <clears throat> on an overcast day in Canberra, I rise on behalf of the Government of the Commonwealth of Australia to mark the passing of Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II and uh, to acknowledge that indeed she has now gone home. In commemorating the life of Her Majesty in the Senate on behalf of the government, I'm aware that I speak on behalf of all Australians. I do not approach this task lightly. Much of the details of Her Majesty's life and her achievements have been widely reported since Her Majesty's passing. Queen Elizabeth II died on the afternoon of September 8 at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. It is neither explicable nor surprising that many Australians report having woken to the time of her passing around 3am uh, our time, thus marked the end of the second Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabethan age. Uh, Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born in London at the home of her maternal grandparents on the 21st of April 1926. In the 1920s, uh, produced uh, some extraordinary men and women, including my own mother and father. For the parents of baby boomers, duty always came first. There was a sober endurance about the way they confronted the challenges of life, stoic, patient, resilient. 
The Queen's father, the Duke of York, was formally proclaimed King George VI uh, in December 1936. This proclamation made Princess Elizabeth the heiress presumptive, and from that point on, her path through her life was preordained. So at the tender age of 10, she confronted the fact that uh, her life was to be one of service and duty to others. For her, there was no other option. She was to be queen, whether she liked it or not. Hers was a life devoted to service to others, to her people, to her commonwealth, and to her family. This was the promise uh, uh, to the people of her dominions on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. It's fair to say that leaders of all persuasions are adept at making promises, but not so adept at keeping them. This could not be said of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In my later years, I've often reflected on the nature of her vocation. Hers was a life of seemingly endless work. Public ceremonies, receptions, community events, political and diplomatic meetings, all held together within a schedule of grinding and exhausting travel. It was only in the last few years that I can ever recall uh, her ever excusing herself <coughs> Uh, from a work engagement, and then only ever on the basis of failing health. Quite remarkably, two days before her passing, struggling with her mobility in a cardigan, a tartan skirt, and with her trademark uh, handbag on her arm, she fulfilled her constitutional duty by accepting the resignation of Boris Johnson and inviting uh, the Right Honourable uh, Elizabeth Truss MP to form a new administration. The second Elizabeth, 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 I'm struggling with that word. I'm sorry, President. <coughs> the second Elizabethan age began while the world was recovering from the cataclysm uh, of World War. Nonetheless, her ep ep epoch uh, was still marked by earth-shattering change, including but not limited to revolutions, republics, coup d'etats, and wars in any number of strife-torn countries. Uh, as a relatively young head of state, she navigated the turbulent 1960s. Some of us uh, who uh, <coughs> were in our early teens at that time will, will remember the howling gales of change that ripped across the planet. John Lennon once observed of the 60s that we were all on a ship, our generation, a ship going to discover the new world, and the Beatles were in the crow's nest of that ship. ship. Well, the Beatles might have well been in the crow's nest, but Her Majesty was on the bridge because that's where her duty demanded that she be. Looking at the horizon is one thing, <coughs> setting a course to achieve it is quite another. It's been claimed that uh, Queen Elizabeth had a special relationship with Australia. There is, a lot of, there is a lot of evidence for this. Her Majesty visited Australia on 16 separate occasions. She is said to have liked us and trusted us. If one is uh, in any doubt about her trust, consider her decision to have her eldest son, an heir presumptive, educated uh, for a time in Australia. In uh, 2011, uh, <coughs> the then Prince Charles joked in public <coughs> about being referred by his fellow students as a pommy bastard. Nonetheless, King Charles III is universally remembered by those students as a thoroughly decent bloke. Uh, whatever happens in the future, Australians know that the King Charles likes us, understands us and respects us. Understanding that Charles uh, would eventually be king, sending him to the uh, timber top was an example of Her Majesty's acute foresight. As King Charles has uh, acceded to the throne, we recognise our new monarch and give thanks for the seamless manner in which he assumes his heavy burden of responsibility as king. We also express our hope that his reign will be marked by an abundance of the same qualities that mark that of his late beloved mother. 
It is instructive for us, in this place particularly, to reflect on the way Her Majesty discharged her constitutional responsibilities. In early uh, 1986, as the Queen of Australia, she adroitly navigated the introduction of the Australia Act. It was, in essence, a formal declaration that the Commonwealth of Australia was com completely constitutionally independent from the United Kingdom. The Australia Act, among other things, relegates the monarch to a largely symbolic role and ensured that the High Court of Australia was the highest point of legal appeal, rather than the various state Supreme Courts having ultimate recourse to the Privy Council in Britain. It is a measure of Queen Elizabeth's political sensibilities that she appreciated our wish to be constitutionally independent. However, because of the independence of the states, the Australia Act stipulates that the monarch is to accept the advice of state premiers. At the time, Her Majesty was concerned that advice tendered by her state premiers might run counter to the interests of other states or indeed the Commonwealth Government. This was a particularly astute uh, <coughs> observation uh, by her, as some Senate co uh, colleagues might recall the, unpredictable, the under unpredictability and intemperate nature of the then Premier of Queensland, Joe Bajelke Peterson. Her Majesty was pro prodigiously well educated in her constitutional rights and responsibilities. As a constitutional monarch, Queen Elizabeth exercised that const uh, what uh, constitutional expert uh, Professor Anne Toomey says has described as soft power based on social pressure, political capital and persuasion, but always behind the scenes. Professor Toomey has suggested that Her Majesty was a little more activist and more influential than people might have thought. However, the Queen exercised her influence with quiet subtlety. She was very good at keeping uh, behind closed doors any advice that she gave to ministers. Although Queen Elizabeth uh, did not have any, any direct input into the conduct of Australia's national affairs, she advised 15 British prime ministers. She's, she is said to have uh, done this in an effective yet uncontroversial manner, expressing her opinion with a quizzical raised eyebrow or a gentle inter interrogative. Now, do you really think that this is a good idea, Prime Minister? At the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, it's also timely to reflect on the Commonwealth of Nations, usually referred to simply as the Commonwealth, a, po a political association of some 56 states. That members um, are connected through their use of the English language and their historical ties uh, with the British uh, Empire. Her Majesty was wholly devoted to the Commonwealth and worked tirelessly to maintain its relevance and its influence in an increasingly fractured global environment. As the relationship tides between countries ebb and flow, as strategic alliances fluctuate, there is comfort and security in being a, a member of an association of states committed to shared values of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. Given what has transpired in our own region for the last few years, in 2022, we are once again grateful for Queen Elizabeth's foresight and her unflagging commitment to the Commonwealth. In recent days, any number of people have recounted seeing, meeting or spending time with Her Majesty. My first memory of uh, Queen Elizabeth was a nine-year-old <coughs> when she toured Adelaide as, uh, uh, in uh, 1963. As she drove by, I can still remember wondering what Her Majesty's life was actually like. As young as I was, I didn't imagine for one moment that it was a lot of fun uh, being sitting in a black car um, on a hot Adelaide afternoon, uh, waving a gloved hand at school students lining the route. I was fortunate enough to meet Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip twice in 2011, once with my oldest daughter Mary in Parliament House and once with my middle daughter Tess <coughs> when I was uh, Parliamentary Secretary for Sustainability. Her Majesty was in Brisbane to launch a water recycling project at the height of the drought. I, I found her warm, engaging and funny. Do you really recycle water? She asked me with a grin. Um, yes, you can laugh at that. <laughs> 
Uh, we've all been lucky enough to uh, hear the recollections of people who knew Queen Elizabeth beyond the formal figure uh, so well known to us via the medium of television. None of us are surprised to learn of her deep humanity, her wicked sense of humour and her genuine appreciation of people from all walks of life. Queen Elizabeth passed, uh, the earth uh, moves a little slower, the sun shines a little less brightly and the wind has an extra chill. Queen Elizabeth uh, was Queen of Australia, but she was also a lifelong partner of Prince Philip, a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, an aunt and a godmother. In our sadness, we also know that her family uh, are grieving deeply at this time. Regardless of our personal positions on royalty and our constitutional arrangements, Australians are united in sadness and gratitude uh, for the life of duty and service. We have witnessed the passing of a truly remarkable woman. Well done, good and faithful servant. We shall not see her like again, and may she rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Birmingham. <coughs> On the death of Elizabeth II, Queen of Australia and her other realms and territories, Head of the Commonwealth, we give thanks for her truly remarkable life. Of the countless words describing the life and legacy of Queen Elizabeth II, one stands above all others. Duty. A duty laid upon a little girl. A duty embraced by a young woman. A duty fulfilled for 70 years by a lady of grace and diligence. The Queen exemplified the essence of duty. She lived and performed her duties not to advance self-interest, but to underpin the interests of her nation, the Commonwealth and the people she served throughout the world. Among the vast challenges the world has witnessed throughout the Queen's long life has been a fracturing of some commonly shared experiences. We live in a world of more choices which see us travel diverse paths in life, sometimes oblivious to the experiences of others. However, the death of the Queen has overwhelmed that trend. It has brought a nation, a commonwealth of nations and a global community together in ways that virtually no other event could. There has been a poignancy, as everyone, from kings, presidents and prime ministers through to school children and charity workers, have reflected reflections from corridors of power the world over through to kitchen tables in every corner of our planet. Together we have reflected on the woman, Elizabeth. We have reflected on her reign as queen. We have reflected on the changed times she bore witness to and upon the institution she put before all else. Then Princess Elizabeth was 10 when her father unexpectedly inherited the throne, becoming King George VI. Reportedly, her little sister, Princess Margaret, asked, does that mean you're going to be queen? Princess Elizabeth said it probably did. Poor you, Princess Margaret allegedly replied. Whether this report is true or not, it underlines the reality that Her Majesty did not choose her life. Fate chose her. How we respond to the twists and turns of fate is the true test of us all. Elizabeth Windsor chose to wholeheartedly and dutifully dedicate herself to the life that had chosen her. Princess Elizabeth's now famous declaration on the occasion of her 21st birthday, that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service, was perhaps the most powerful of vows ever made and fulfilled. A child of the war, Princess Elizabeth lived through the battle for British sovereignty against the evils of Nazism and fascism. She learned the importance of stoicism in times of trouble, leadership in the face of fear. When it may have been easy to cloister, to shelter or to hide, the young Elizabeth contributed by training as a wartime mechanic. She lived by example, donning the uniform of a military she would one day lead. She spoke to her nation to strengthen its confidence and resolve. Princess Elizabeth's exposure to tyrants and autocrats of that era can only have strengthened her commitment to the model of parliamentary democracy and system of rights, freedoms and responsibilities that had evolved under her monarchical predecessors. Her Majesty lived a royal life like no other. The glare of the public gaze, the ever-present camera lens 
blurred the lines between private and public in ways for which there was no prior role model. Glimpses into the life of the young Princess Elizabeth were initially brief, snatched through movie tone newsreels. But 96 years after her birth, in a vastly changed world, the death of Queen Elizabeth II was simultaneously announced across media platforms from the traditional, traditional notice board of yesteryear to the ubiquitous social media platforms of the modern era. Her Majesty's reign as Queen Elizabeth II began on the fateful day of 6 February 1952, when, thousands of kilometres from home, she was told of the death of her father. None in this chamber would remember that day or any monarch other than her late Majesty. Very few people do. In fulfilling her duties, her Majesty was for 70 years a constant, a reassurance, an anchor of stability and dependability. That is why her death has been felt so deeply and personally across the world, across the Commonwealth and here in Australia. Queen Elizabeth was there for the rise and fall of nations, the escalation and cessation of the Cold War, man first walking on the moon, terrorist attacks and technological advances that have changed our world beyond measure. When a global pandemic struck in the 94th year of her life, Queen Elizabeth again did her duty. As she had done countless times before, she reassured a troubled world. She reached out to the health workers on the front line and she led by example. There was no more powerful example of the sacrifices the pandemic demanded than that image of a selfless queen sitting all alone in a chapel to farewell Prince Philip, her cherished husband of 74 years. Her late majesty also lived through the sweeping social changes of the 1960s and beyond, which have brought long overdue advances in equality. The queen herself was a role model for women, not necessarily in all that she said, but in what she did. Queen Elizabeth ascended the throne at a time when women who married frequently had, who married, had to frequently leave the workforce. Yet she was a working mother, a world leader of influence, the head of the armed services who didn't just take the salute in uniform, but did so on horseback. Her late majesty worked with 15 British prime ministers, 14 US presidents, 16 Australian prime ministers, and hundreds of other Commonwealth and world leaders, including on visits to 117 different countries. Overwhelmingly, her interlocutors were men. Yet her constant presence sent a strong message signifying that it did not always have to be so. On 16 separate visits to Australia, the only reigning monarch to ever have ever done so, one was for the opening of this building, Australia's Parliament House. On the 9th of May 1988, as part of Australia's bicentennial celebrations, the Queen noted that the first session of the Australian Parliament was opened by her grandfather. On the same day, 87 years earlier in 1901, and that it was her father who had opened the old Parliament House, known then as the Provisional Parliament House, also on the same day in 1927. At the opening of this building, Her Majesty reflected on Australia's growing place in the world, saying, commitment to parliamentary democracy lies at the heart of this nation's maturity, tolerance and humanity. This is surely one of the characteristics which has attracted so many people to come to Australia from countries which do not enjoy the benefits of the parliamentary system in such large measure. This statement reflected her dedication to democratic ideals and her understanding of our journey as a nation and of our growing independence. As former Prime Minister John Howard wrote recently, Her Majesty followed Australia's 1999 Republic referendum intently, but, quote, never wavered from the absolute requirement that it was for the Australian people alone to decide. Such was her enduring commitment to democratic ideals. While our bonds with the United Kingdom remain exceptionally strong, our growing influence and engagement in our own region has been a tangible sign of our nation maturing throughout her reign. Our maturing has also entailed reconciling with our past. The Queen played her role in reconciliation with Indigenous Australians and that journey through the changing nature of her visits to Australia, 
and also through her personal engagements. Like many, I was touched to see the remarks of Senator Dodson reflecting upon the 1999 delegation of Indigenous leaders that he participated in to meet with the Queen at Buckingham Palace. We got in there and we were totally disarmed, Senator Dodson has recalled saying. She was so welcoming. I think for the first time in our lives we were treated properly. She was genuinely interested in what was happening to us. Senator Dodson's generous remarks put him as just one of millions of Australians who hold dear their memories of cherished encounters with the Queen. Royal visits where countless Australians have lined the streets of our towns and cities to catch a glimpse of the Queen, hoping for a street walk during which to say good day or being one of the lucky children to present a posy of flowers to her. Many Australians were touched by the Queen in their deepest hours of need, when she comforted and consoled those hurt by tragedy and disaster. The Queen, along with the Duke of Edinburgh, visited my home state of South Australia seven times. As meticulously planned as any royal visit would be, it wasn't always smooth sailing, quite literally. In 1986, on a five-day visit to mark South Australia's sesquicentenary, rough seas prevented Her Majesty disembarking a royal barge at the birthplace of our state, Glenelg. Several attempts were made to get the barge close enough to the jetty, but it was considered too choppy for Her Majesty to make the leap from the barge to the platform. So they returned to the Royal Yacht Britannia and instead set sail for Port Adelaide. One suspects, given the Queen's practicality, that she was probably less phased by the choppy seas than her aides and would have been happy to make that leap. She did eventually make it back to plant a tree at Glenelg. Indeed, imagine just how many trees the Queen has planted. An enduring legacy is the Queen's Commonwealth canopy, of which Australia has been a strong supporter. As with any visit to Australia, Her Majesty also embraced the moments of informality. She visited the city of Wyala in 1954 and again in 1986, where she was greeted by a giant handmade sign erected by a construct construction crew of European migrants that read, Long live the Queen! G'day, Duke! Well known for her sense of humour, it was reported that Her Majesty loved the greeting. After all, any monarch who pulls out a marmalade sandwich whilst drinking tea with Paddington Bear definitely has the ability for warmth, kindness and a bit of a laugh. Strangely for someone who lived a life so unique, the grief and respect shown following the death of the Queen has been in part due to her relatability. Many people have referred to Her Majesty as being seen like another mum or nana. We bore witness to her starting a family and the joy of watching children grow to be followed by grandchildren and great-children. We caught glimpses of the family picnics, heard tales of her driving too fast or of her getting her car bogged. We were entertained by seeing the Queen's joy as she watched her horse come in first and the world learned more about corgis than we ever wished to. We were saddened when we saw her anguish at family breakdown or personal tragedy. These moments provided the reassurance that, despite being far removed from our daily lives, she too faced challenges that we could relate to. But no matter the circumstances, the Queen's unwavering calm, grace and dignity were a source of comfort, hope and solace. Central to her life was her faith. Hers was not a proselytising type of faith. It was deeper than that. A deep spirituality provided Her Majesty with the capacity to be anchored in times of trouble, uplifting when hope was needed. The Queen's deep faith should serve as a comfort to those saddened by her death. While we all knew this day would come, it nonetheless shocks us when it does. Like the loss of a parent or grandparent, the inevitability of death does not make it easier. Her faith is, no doubt, a comfort to her family at this time. Forced to grieve in public and required to assume new roles in the midst of their mourning, we extend our condolences to the royal family. The death of a monarch is the supreme reminder of the cycle of life. With one door closing, another opens. As we mourn Queen Elizabeth II, we hail the new sovereign, King Charles III. Her commitment to duty is instilled in her successor as he begins a new chapter in a life also dedicated to service. These last 14 days have provided some rare time to reflect. While we have marvelled at the majesty of royal rituals and the beauty of ancient palaces and churches, 
I hope we have all found some time for deeper reflection. The second Elizabethan age was a time of profound change, yet the values that guided Queen Elizabeth II in her life and duties were constant and are enduring. Service to the community, commitment to family, kindness towards others, grace under pressure, learning from the past, hope for the future and respect for the institutions that grant us the opportunities of peace, prosperity and freedom. During Her Majesty's 1986 visit to Adelaide, she unveiled a statue of Catherine Helen Spence. The Scottish-born Australian suffragette was, in 1897, Australia's first female political candidate. Her Majesty and Catherine Helen Spence were both great women, whose lives each spanned two centuries, though never overlapped. Catherine Helen Spence, at her own 80th birthday in 1905, said of herself that she was awakened into a sense of capacity and responsibility, not merely to the family and household, but to the state, to be wise, not for her own selfish interests, but that the world may be glad that she had been born. Those words echo across the century that has followed. They are a fitting epitaph for the life and legacy of Her Majesty. We celebrate her life, a life well lived, a life dedicated to others, a life of exemplary service, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you, ma'am, may you rest in peace, and in the words of your successor, the King, may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Thank you, Senator <coughs> Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I rise on behalf of the Greens to offer our condolence on the death of Elizabeth Alexandra May Windsor, Queen Elizabeth II, and pay our respects to a woman whose life has been like no other. For all but a few of us, her reign as Queen of England, the United Kingdom, Australia and the Commonwealth existed for our entire lifetimes. Seventy years as Queen, the second longest serving monarch in the history of the world. And much has been said of her extraordinary life, both before and of course since the passing, her passing two weeks ago. Yesterday, while many of us were gathered here in Parliament for the memorial service, held in her honour, I reflected on the extraordinary life that she had led. How much the world has changed over the 96 years since her birth. The Prime Ministers and the Presidents that she's met. The wars that she's witnessed. The nation-states that have grown, collapsed and evolved. The changes in technology. The global challenges that have come, gone and continue and the overall social change and progress of us as part of humanity. In reflecting on the life of Queen Elizabeth II, we remember and acknowledge her personal humility, her service and her unflinching commitment to duty. And much of that has already been acknowledged here this morning. I cannot help but reflect on the fact that Her Majesty became Queen and the head of the Commonwealth in 1952 when she was just 25 years old, the same age that I was elected to this place. Now, I was one of 76 Seveners, 226 members of the parliament at the time, and she, however, was one. How lonely that must have been. How extraordinary that experience must have been. The experience of a young Queen Elizabeth as the head of the Commonwealth, of course, dwarfs my own and many others in this place. But as a young woman in this parliament, I cannot but reflect on what it's like to be striving to learn and to stand up in a man's world. And she did this all too often. And she had her doubters, those who believed she wasn't up to the job, those who believed that she would fail, that she wouldn't be taken seriously. And of course, she's seen them all wrong. No one would doubt her commitment uh, to the job, to her service and her duty. Alongside the acknowledgement of the role of the head of the monarchy, we also need to remember and acknowledge the woman, the mother, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, a loss of which we can all understand, and we pay our respects and extend our sympathies to her loved ones. On the day of her passing, one of my colleagues 
um, remarked very early on that the sadness um, that he was feeling was the instant reminder of his own grandmother. And I think we've heard that over and over again from people not just here in Australia but around the world. Because when somebody is lost, whether in public life or in uh, a personal circumstance, it does make you reflect on what you hold dear, the people around you, what you value. It allows us to have a time to pause, to think, to take stock, and an opportunity to reset if indeed that is needed. Such was the significance of her life that she could touch so many in so many different ways. And as the Governor-General David Hurley said at the memorial service yesterday, the death of Queen Elizabeth has prompted mixed reactions from different groups within our community, and absolutely understandably. We cannot give an honest reflection on her life without acknowledging the impact that colonisation has had on our First Nations people and the role that this plays in the stories that we tell ourselves, who we are as a country and who we want to be. And I want to, uh, at this point, acknowledge the First Nations people in this chamber, the members of this parliament, and give a um, special moment of reflection of how they must be feeling and are feeling at this particular time because it isn't the same experience for all of us. It is important that we reflect on the impact of the institution to which Her Majesty belonged and represented during her reign. As a person in public life, she was a constant presence. Over the last 70 years, her image has been a consistent symbol of power, a constant reminder of who we are as a country, and how some of us got here. We remain a constitutional monarchy, despite in many ways that the royal family in England seems so far removed from the everyday lives of ordinary Australians in a modern, multicultural nation. We are a constitutional monarchy because in 1770, James Cook sailed up the coast and declared the land for the British. He did not consult the people who were living here. He did not sign a treaty. According to his diaries, his party fired shots. In 1787, orders were issued in London for Captain Arthur Phillip to sail over and establish a colony in Botany Bay, of course we now know as Sydney, after the name, named after the Lord Sydney the man who had appointed him. These orders instructed Philip to take possession of the eastern half of Australia without consent. First Nations people have never ceded sovereignty of the lands, the water, that they had cared for for 65,000 years. By 1788, the first fleet would arrive, marking the start of the British Crown's domination of this country. From 1795, we have the first reports of First Nation massacres in the name of the Crown. As colonies were established <clears throat> around the country, the massacres followed. Over the next 140 years, there were hundreds of them. What we know, what has been recorded, over 11,000 First Nations people killed as part of this. Now, the Queen, who has passed, did not personally commit any of these, of course. She did not authorise them. She did not remove children from their parents or personally attempt to remove and decimate one of the oldest cultures in the world. But she was the representative of the government and the institution that did. And now as we acknowledge her passing and we consider the legacy of what it means in the land that we now know as Australia, 
which we were all proud citizens. It was declared Crown land. Momentous events <clears throat> create great moments of reflection, and this is a great moment. Moments of loss and death cause us to consider deep reflection, allow us to, as humans to think about the values that we hold. As people and society, what type of world we want to live in, to take stock and to reset. A time to reflect on who we are in this country and who we want to be moving forward. It is a time for us to come to terms with our own history and to reflect on the future that we want, united in respect for all peoples together. Now is the time for justice, for recognition and respect for First Nations people. It is the time to implement the Uluru Statement, truth, treaty and voice, because this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It is one thing to acknowledge the mistakes of the past. It is another to make amends. A treaty was needed decades ago, and like many other nations colonised by the British Empire, we need to do the same. Generations of oppression, trauma and suffering as a result of colonisation must be reckoned with. Now is the time for us to do this, to move forward for treaty, for, tr for truth and for a genuine voice for First Nations people. It's never too late to say sorry, and it's never too late to make amends. It is time for us to also join the scores of other countries who have cut ties with the British Empire and become a republic during the last 70 years of Her Majesty's reign. Countries like India, Jordan, Malaysia, Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, all of whom now have their own head of state. Of course, we will remain and retain the Westminster style of government, the separation of powers and the separation of church and state, but our head of state should be one of us, an Australian. Our new monarch is King Charles III, heir to Queen Elizabeth II. And as a person, he's waited patiently for the job most of his life, had plenty of time to think about how he would take this role on. He cares about a lot of causes that are dear to my heart and many that the Greens agree with. We welcome his commitment to the environment and to saving this planet from dangerous climate change. We welcome his climate activism and we hope that this continues. I was heartened to hear the words of Prince William today, calling for climate action urgently. Both his father and he understand the crisis that we find ourselves in in this particular moment of history and that we all have a responsibility to take action. Leaving it to the next generation is simply not an option. But Charles III is not our choice. The Australian people didn't get to choose, and we should have, and we should be able to in the future. That power as a sovereign head of state that has been transferred to the king, and while people, in many cases, good people, inhabit these roles. They are also roles that are about retaining a form of power which has spanned the globe. So while we reflect on the extraordinary life of Queen Elizabeth II and consider the mixed reactions that this creates for many of us across the community, we must also think and don't use in vain this deep reflection 
but use it as an opportunity and a moment to think about who we are, who we want to be and what we're going to do to force the next future, the next chapter of our nation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. And on behalf of the National Party in the Senate, I rise to uh, associate our senators uh, with the remarks of the parties of government um, to mark the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the ascension of King Charles III. We send our deep condolences and sincere condolences to Her Majesty's family. Uh, she was our monarch and Australia's head of state for 70 of our nation's 121 years of federation. And on reflection, I, I wanted to thank uh, the Prime Minister of our country, despite being a deep and committed Republican in the way he has represented our nation, not just here at home and comforted citizens and subjects who are deeply mourning the loss of the Queen, but how he has represented uh, our nation overseas. And uh, I just wanted to quote some of his empathetic remarks. From the moment the young princess became Queen, Her Majesty's dedication to duty and service over self were the hallmarks of her reign, performing her duty with fidelity, integrity and respect for everyone she met. Queen Elizabeth II was a wise and enduring presence in our national life. And similarly, I think um, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Dutton, uh, when we were at the memorial service yesterday, we heard three, I think, amazing contributions from both our Governor-General calling on us to continue sincerely the journey of reconciliation as a country, but also from our Prime Minister, uh, Mr Dutton. And uh, he, he made remarks, despite her royalty, she possessed extraordinary humility, greeting all those she met with courtesy, treating them as equals and offering an attentive ear. The adjectives around our monarch on her passing, um, I think, have given all of us pause for reflection as leaders within our own political parties, within our own communities, of her servant approach. And I think um, I know I personally, and uh, I hope I speak for all of us, um, want to take a bit more of her in our everyday um, going about our business uh, and the example she gave us. It's been acknowledged that our Queen was devoted to duty and her public commitment was unwavering. Family and faith were important to her and her sense of commitment and dedication to her position as monarch was absolute. No matter what was thrown at her, uh, she had nurtured the monarchy through times of change and many emotional challenges that most families uh, have to go through. Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on the 21st of April 1926 in London. She was the eldest daughter of Prince Albert, Duke of York, and Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, and as uh, the child of the youngest son of the then King George V, uh, she had little prospect of thinking she'd ascend one day to the crown. And she went off and married that very handsome Prince Philip, uh, who was the love of her life, who she is now reunited. Uh, with and had four children, Charles, Anne, Andrew and Edward. Obviously, uh, the health of King George VI entered a serious decline in the summer of 1951, uh, and Princess Elizabeth represented him at the tr Tripping of the Colour and on various other state occasions. And the Princess uh, Elizabeth and uh, the Duke were on tour in Australia and New Zealand when, en route to Kenya, news reached them of the King's death on February 6, 1952. Elizabeth was only 25 when the news came and she was now Queen. Her coronation was held at Westminster Abbey uh, in 1953 on the 2nd of June and the following year the royal couple left for an extensive tour of the Commonwealth including Australia and it was the first visit to Australia by a reigning monarch. She has been a regular visitor to Australia throughout her reign. 16 visits. The Queen has celebrated all aspects of culture and life, from sheep farms to natural wonders such as the Great Barrier Reef, from the triumph of Olympic and Commonwealth sporting meetings to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art, culture and tradition. The Queen was known to favour simplicity in court life and was also known to take a serious and informed interest in government business aside from traditional ceremonial duties. 
<coughs> Queen visits to Australia incorporated significant ceremonial events, including the opening of federal parliament in 1974, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 1981, and Australia's bicentenary celebrations and the opening of this building in 1988, where uh, her speech, I think, still speaks to us. And I quote, Parliamentary democracy is a compelling ideal, but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed, and it is only too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and of their elected representatives to make it work. This is surely one of the characteristics that has attracted so many people to come uh, to Australia from countries which do not enjoy the benefits of a parliamentary system in such large measure. And this includes uh, being part of a constitutional monarchy, where our head of state is above politics. And I think we've seen the constancy of the Crown on display over the last two weeks, as we saw our now King, Charles III, take on uh, royal duties, but then obviously the new Prince of Wales uh, and his young son and heir, uh, Prince George, uh, attending the grandmother's funeral. The Queen was also the only female member of the royal family to have entered the armed forces and served in War II. Uh, as, a, as a woman in leadership, I find her ability to role model uh, decades before uh, it was popular or accepted uh, for women to be having very serious uh, conversations with very serious men about affairs of state. Uh, this was a young woman who um, her servant leadership, I think, and the fact that she actually, um, despite being a member of the royal family, uh, joined the armed forces just showed that uh, she didn't see gender as a barrier to what her, her role modelling was going to be. The royal visit of 1954, and a big shout out to my mum, who was one of those baby boomers on the side of a road somewhere in a country town waving a flag uh, for the Queen, it was probably the most popular of all royal visits. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh undertook a tour of uh, all our states and territories, arriving into Sydney Harbour. Um, and I think 2,000 miles by road, 130 hours in motor cars, um, 70 country towns, and 100 public speeches. Um, that, if that's a work ethic that we senators could adopt, um, I think uh, maybe our institution would be a lot more popular a little like the monarchy is at the moment, uh, if we applied that to, to our work. Um, but the vastness of the tour by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in 1954, um, Prime Minister then Menzies thought that maybe we needed less formal tours uh, going forward, and that is absolutely what occurred. In 1973, she opened the landmark Sydney Opera House, um, and in 1977, uh, Australia also figured prominently in the Silver Jubilee celebrations. <coughs> Her last visit was in 2011 for a reception in the Great Hall as part of the tour, uh, ending with uh, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth. <coughs> and for those of us, uh, and there are many here today who were at that particular event, um, Prime Minister Gillard um, was ushering Her Majesty uh, through the Great Hall and. We all had, I was a newly, very new senator. I think I must have only been here about three or four months, um, and it obviously brought my royalist mother up for the occasion as well, who was breathless just looking at it all. But I lined up. Uh, the leader of the National Party then was uh, Warren Trust, and he said, "Bridget, we're going to have an afternoon tea with Her Majesty at Government House on the weekend. You get to the front of the queue, so you get to meet her." And oh, okay. And Prime Minister's introducing Her Majesty to each. You know, I'd practised my curtsying um, to every MP, and I could see poor Prime Minister Gillard's face when she suddenly saw this new female senator, and had no idea who I was. Um, to <laughs> and this f face that she's just going to have to um, do something terrible anyway. She, Julia, oh, sorry, Prime Minister Gillard said, "Your Majesty." The leader of the National Party, Warren Truss, who was about ten rows deep uh, back in the bleachers, and Warren, you know, gets to the front and knew what his duty was because uh, he was going to assist the Prime Minister with uh, introducing our newest senator, 
uh, Senate, the newest National Party senator, uh, Bridget McKenzie, from the great state of Victoria. He probably didn't add great. And uh, Her Majesty, I did my curtsying, and uh, then Her Majesty said to me, "How new is new?" Well, just she was just gorgeous, silvery, um, and as everybody has said who's met her, um, genuine, warm, and accommodating. And I know she. Um, took that personality. Everyone's commented on her humour, uh, who knew her as well. Um, the Queen was aware of the modern role of monarchy, allowing, for example, the televising of the royal family's domestic life, condoning um, the dissolution of her sister's marriage, she, uh, commenting on uh, 1992 just being a very uh, troubling year for her family, uh, not just as monarchs but as a family. And she was very, very pragmatic when in that year um, there was also <coughs> resentment, there was a recession in Britain, and she pragmatically decided uh, to pay taxes on her private income, uh, making sure the monarchy was not just seen to be believed but also relatable to um, everyday Australians. She stood out and became the first British monarch to visit the Irish Republic and to set foot in Ireland since 1911. Um, she continued to approach every engagement with vigour and spirit, fulfilling her duty with dedication and dignity. But one of the things I really, really enjoy about Her Majesty is she was a countrywoman at heart. She was never more happier than uh, being in Balmoral, than riding her horse well into her 90s. That is no easy task. Anybody that's uh, ridden a horse before, um, pursuing farming interests, um, enjoying hunting, uh, etc. In fact, we corresponded about um, my concerns that the royal, the RSPCA, a royal society no less, was seeking to shut down horse racing, seeking to make changes to farming practices, uh, stop hunting. And uh, Her Majesty, who enjoyed all three of those pursuits, um, encouraged me to continue to pursue um, the RSPCA. Um, she brought her horseback riding talents to her role as monarch um, as she trooped the colour as well. And she loved a horse race. And it was great to see um, some of our great Australian trainers attend her funeral on our behalf. So whether it was her Christmas message, uh, whether it was trooping of the colour, whether it was um, Seeing her on our shores, Queen Elizabeth had been, has been a significant part of our nation's story uh, for her 70 years. Popular, measured, much loved, she lived a long and fruitful life and she'll be remembered as a dedicated public servant, an adored daughter, wife, mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. She refused to slow down and I just think that photo in swearing in the latest Prime Minister Liz Truss is just fabulous. Her eyes twinkling, her eye, uh, mouth smiling. Um, only two days later to uh, be taken from us. As a party of over a century old, um, the National Party in our own constitution has objects which require us to promote within Australia a society that is based on Christian ethics and loyalty to the Crown. We are, uh, I would say, the only political party in this place that still holds the <coughs> tenants. Um, to, to our core. Her, our, her passing has been seen as an outpouring of grief, as silent crowds gathered to pay their respects to our sovereign, our queen, a wonderful example of servant leadership. Her faith as head of the Church of England was clear and unambiguous, and I think you saw a service uh, that she had so much input into that really made Christianity accessible to the millions of people of all faiths and many of no faith. Um, to see Christianity uh, on display in a way that a lot of people can um, relate to. There will be questions following um, her death around our constitutional arrangements over the coming period. Our constitution is one of the six oldest uh, continually operated con in the world. No country should alter its constitutional arrangements if they work well, simply because of where a sovereign ra resides. For a long time, governors-general and governors in Australia have been Australians. 
We should not dismiss constitutional monarchy simply because it's seen as unfashionable by some in society or because the popular media are going through a phase of disaffectation with some members of the royal family who early, earlier they covered with fawning attention. It's also important to emphasise that in every legal, real respect, Australia is a completely independent country, as was finally affirmed when the Queen of Australia personally assented to the Australia Act in 1986. Um, I think, the, as I said, the constancy of the Crown uh, is on display, and uh, our deepest sympathies with the National Party to the royal family and to subjects right throughout the Commonwealth. May we in this place seek to emulate her example uh, in service to others, in service to our nation and her ferocious work ethic. A sense of duty, humility, quiet courage on behalf of the people who also sent us here. Um, Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Long live the King. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I rise today to add to the condolences on the passing of Her Majesty on behalf of the people of the ACT and Norfolk Island. As others have noted, over the past fortnight we have paid respect, honouring the Queen's life and service. In doing so, I also want to acknowledge the feelings of First Nations peoples and the history these events have caused us to revisit, as we should, honestly and with compassion. What comes next will be a conversation about our future. My hope is that we can have that discussion with respect. I met Her Majesty in 2008 at Windsor Castle during a tour of the UK with the Wallabies. I was struck by her ability to find interest in whatever conversation she was engaged in, despite the extraordinary number of people she must have met every week she seemed to be able to bring a real warmth and attention to whoever she was speaking with. Rather than simply sharing my own thoughts or experiences, I would like to take the opportunity to share a few short reflections from people in the ACT and Norfolk Island. Reflecting on these stories, we are reminded of the character of Queen Elizabeth as a dedicated public servant and a person whose warmth touched many people in our country and abroad. We are reminded that the Queen served through a time of great change and of how different the world looks now to when she was crowned. Firstly, I'd like to share the story of Gordon Robson. An 89-year-old, Gordon recently told me he remembers the Queen's coronation in 1953 as if it were yesterday. At 19, he was picked to go to London for the occasion, beating 96 other candidates from Queensland. At the very last minute, his contingent were asked to stand guard at the palace and participate in a changing of the guard. Nerves were electric, as he recently told the ABC. No one knew about it, and so it was just panic stations. Fortunately, the day went off without a hitch. As Gordon said, it was a hell of a trip. It was just magical and so overwhelming. Just knowing the Queen was sitting in a chair watching, we were doing it for her. RSM Britain was heard to say to one of our officers afterwards, that was one of the greatest changing of the guards I have ever seen. We were thrilled. It was the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. The next is from Carolyn in Canberra, which I'll read directly. In 1952, when Elizabeth became queen, it was a time when women were not heads of countries or at the table of boardrooms or even office managers. At the time, married women were not even allowed to work in the Australian public service. Yet at the age of 25, and a mother of two young children, she took on the responsibility as the head of several countries. I often wonder what she wanted to do when she was young, before she knew her destiny was to be queen. Her duty extended right to the end, just days before passing. Her first British Prime Minister was born in 1874, her last in 1975 from Janet in Canberra. I've always admired the Queen and her ability to do her work. She was not perfect, but she did an amazing job for an extraordinary length of time. We must remember she was a human being, a wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. From Mary on Norfolk Island. In 1974, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh visited Norfolk Island, one of the furthest and most remote reaches of the Commonwealth. 
My late husband, Bernie, was honoured to be chosen to show the royal family around the Kingston area, travelling around in the Queen's car. Bernie was amazed at their intense interest and curiosity in the historic area and their extreme graciousness. Yesterday, we took time to mourn the passing of Her Late Majesty. As we know, and I've been reminded by my community, there is yet more to mourn. First Nations people have been mourning for centuries, for, an for their ancestors, for their children, and for their lands that were stolen. We have yet to finish this mourning, this sorry business. Ahead of us are some difficult conversations about our heritage and how we grow from here. I'm conscious that the job of reconciliation feels impossible under the shadow of the British Empire. We are called to have these conversations soon, when we are both honest about our history, what has brought us here, and we bring into focus how much we have in common, what binds us together. We can then forge a path forward that allows us to strengthen our bonds and pride in this great country. We have a shared love for this incredible continent, a desire to build great lives for our families, a commitment to ensuring all Australians have the opportunity to reach their potential, a character that rises to the challenge, that shows its best when the chips are down and communities face natural disasters. We have a growing recognition and celebration of the oldest continuing cultures in the world. This requires the uncomfortable acknowledgement that modern Australia was built on the dispossession of First Nations people, and there is much work to do here, as we have heard over the last two weeks. You and I, President, and no one in this place or the other personally oversaw this, but we have the great privilege of being able to help further the conversation about what Australia can look like and take meaningful steps towards helping that make that happen. What are the things we must do to begin to face up to this history? How do we ensure we take up the generous offer of the Uluru Statement from the heart and have a voice that can guide truth and reconciliation? How do we have these conversations in a way that unites rather than divides. This is a huge challenge, but an even bigger opportunity for all of us. We can both acknowledge the Queen's steady presence in a changing world, while also furthering the conversation about what it means to build our future together here in Australia in that changing world. I will leave you this First Nations proverb, read by Her Late Majesty at the 2011 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. We are all visitors to this time, this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. Thank you, Senator Pocock. I understand that informal arrangements have been agreed for the allocation of time for the remainder of the debate. I ask the clocks to set. I beg your pardon. I ask the clerks to set the clocks to five minutes accordingly. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Over the past two weeks, Australians have remembered a remarkable leader, a woman of warmth and humanity, and a constant through a period of enormous transformation for the world, for the Commonwealth, for Australia, and also for the constituency I represent here in the ACT and in Norfolk Island, where the Queen visited in 1974. The Queen was a close friend of our nation's capital, a cherished hometown, uh, and was the city that she visited the most. From the moment she first arrived here in 1954, stepping out at Old Parliament House in her coronation gown, the Queen saw in Canberra the promise of a modern Australia. Half a century ago, she said at the time, Canberra was little more than a dream in the minds of a few men. Today it is established and flourishing. A beautiful city is being created. As the years passed and over 13 subsequent visits, the Queen watched that creation unfold. She was here for so many of our moments, the big and the small. Whether she was cutting ribbons at the ANU's RG Menzies Library, the National Carillion, the High Court, the National Gallery or this very building we meet in today. Whether she was being fated by 16,000 excited children at Manuka Oval or dutifully inaugurating Benython Primary School, whether she was honouring Canberra's emergency responders with a handshake and warm words of thanks, 
or sparking fierce local debate about the pronunciation of Manuka, or is it Manuka? Or simply stealing a quiet moment observing the kangaroos in government house grounds, the grounds at Yarralumla that she loved and felt so at home in. You got the sense that as she watched our city grow, the Queen made a real effort to know us, to know who we were and who we wanted to be. Canberrans were proud that the Queen thought of our city as her home away from home in Australia. And I know that those who shared a moment with her over the years saw much more than a monarch. They saw genuine interest, a person who put people at ease um, for those with, who were nervous at meeting her. A little girl who greeted the Queen at Floriard one year said to her mum afterwards, Mum, it was like talking to your grandma. She was so tiny and soft. That same day, the Queen pointed out the English daisies to one of the gardeners at Floriard, and he said he would remember that moment for the rest of his life. It was an honour to meet her in 2011 as Chief Minister. The day we met, I remember clearly. Um, her stay here in 2011, where I met with her several times over her week-long stay. On arrival at the beginning of her visit, the setting was decidedly low-key, a Wednesday evening on the tarmac at Fairburn. Standing next to me was the then Prime Minister Julia Gillard and then Governor-General Dame Quentin Bryce. We were there to greet Her Majesty for what would become her final visit to Australia. And it wasn't until we were standing in ceremonial order with the Federation Guard welcoming Her Majesty that it dawned on me, four leaders in a row, four women, a major first in the history of women's leadership in our country, and it will remain a lasting memory for me. As Canberrans take in the view upstairs on the Queen's Terrace here and follow the gaze of the Queen's bronze effigy, as we take our seats in Queen Elizabeth II's grandstand at Thoroughbred Park or meet up with friends at Queanbeyan's Park bearing her name, as we give thanks for the life-changing care provided to generations of Canberra families by the nurses, midwives, counsellors and doctors at the QE2 Family Centre in Curtin, and as we wander the lake's edge along Queen Elizabeth Terrace or stroll over the bridge to Queen Elizabeth II Island, our city gently reminds us her Majesty the Queen was a part of our history and we of hers. May she rest in peace. Senator Cash. Thank you, Deputy President Acting. It is an honour and a privilege to rise to speak to this condolence motion for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the greatest and most enduring leader the world has ever seen. Over the past two weeks, while we have mourned and reflected on Her Majesty's extraordinary life, Many people from all around the world have made observations about what made this remarkable woman so special. There is, of course, no single observation that can answer this question. In fact, a life lived so well, in which so much was achieved and so much good was done, in many ways defies analysis or observation. It simply speaks for itself. I honour and pay tribute today to a woman who, in every way possible, lived up to a promise that she made at a very young age. As we have heard, it was the then Princess Elizabeth who, on her 21st birthday, on April 21, 1947, gave a speech in which she said, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. What a vow to make to literally millions of people in Commonwealth countries all around the globe. We now know, of course, that Her Majesty lived a very long life and without a doubt fulfilled that promise right up to the last moments of her life. There Her Majesty was just two days before she passed, swearing in the new British Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Elizabeth Truss. And despite her obvious frailty, she performed that duty to perfection. I think the ultimate selfless act at the end of her life was how she did not burden her subjects with any worry of her health. She just quietly retreated to her beloved Balmoral 
to embark upon her final journey. My first encounter with Queen Elizabeth was as an 18-year-old university student in Western Australia. Her Majesty was on her 1988 bicentenary tour of Australia, in which she visited every state and territory and, of course, officially opened this place, the new Parliament House. I was honoured to be invited to an official garden party in Perth and had the privilege of meeting and speaking with Her Majesty. I still remember how at ease she made us all feel and how vivacious she was. Her Majesty was genuinely enjoying being in Australia, and for me, like so many others, it was a privilege to be in her presence. I was delighted to be able to meet Her Majesty again in Perth when she visited for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting during her final tour of Australia in 2011. It struck me at the time that she still displayed the same spirit and the same genuine love and affection for Australia that she had all those years earlier. She visited Australia on 16 separate occasions during her reign and was deeply loved and respected by the people of this nation. The Queen was the rock of our constitutional monarchy and represented the stability we have in our great democracy. Her Majesty showed us from the beginning to the end of her reign that she was a lady of grace, dignity and duty. That is how she reigned. Her Majesty had a genuine affection for her subjects and a genuine desire to see them succeed. It is one of the great lessons in leadership that the Queen has given this world. A true leader has a deep desire for those she leads to succeed. Her selfless and unfailing devotion to duty is also a great lesson, particularly for all of us in this place where we gather to serve the Australian people. If we were able to show just some of the dedication to duty that Her Majesty did during 70 years as our monarch, we will go a long way to serving the Australian people as they truly deserve. This condolence motion today brings to an end the official mourning period and commemoration of Her Majesty's life. But I feel for many of us she will be in our thoughts for the rest of our lives. What an inspiration she was and will remain for millions of people all over the world. Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Long live the King. Senator Cox. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to add my voice to the motion of condolence. For 70 of our 120 years of federation, Queen Elizabeth II has served as our sovereign head of state, providing a constant, steady presence during a period of significant change. She committed her life to the service and duty of the Crown, accepting these responsibilities when Britain was rebuilding its national identity after the Second World War. The Queen's long reign granted her iconic status. The outpouring of grief we've seen over the past fortnight is unprecedented, with people lining up to be part of this important moment in history. To her family and those who knew her, I send my condolences, and I hope they have the space, the time to mourn their much-loved mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. To the rest of us, she was a symbolic figure. These symbols have different meanings for different people spanning over many generations across the world. The unquestionable impact of the Queen has a continual and lasting symbolism for Australians and those of other Commonwealth countries across the world, and a very, very different legacy, particularly for our First Peoples here in Australia. In these past few days, I have followed and reflected on the people's sense of loss, uncertainty and sadness, and I want to acknowledge the nuanced, complex emotions that we are feeling right now as a nation. Amongst these are the feelings of anger, distress, hurt and frustration by First Nations people who, unfortunately, their sorry business does not end today. The irony comes from so-called progressives in this country who are silencing the voices, their disapproval for anyone who is brave enough to speak up since the Queen died a fortnight ago. We are a mature nation capable of conversations that both commemorate the life of a public figure 
while calling out the problematic legacy of the British Empire. I will not focus on the faults and failures of the Crown, as this is an important conversation for another day, but today I will respectfully acknowledge the long and dutiful life of the Queen. With reference to our relational sphere, that continues some of the oppressive systems that benefit a few and not all of us as Australians. Australians believe in a fair go, that we are all equal and we deserve equal rights and opportunities. For my people, we have a very different, different lived experience that has been one of resilience and survival, fighting to protect and defend our ancestral knowledges, culture, language and sacred places, all of which we draw our strength, our identity and our sovereignty, which we have never ceded. These are tough conversations to hear, share and even harder to live through the oppressive systems that continue to perpetuate them. And as a nation, we have to tell all sides of the story. And this process starts with me, it starts here with you, and it starts right here in the federal parliament. This week marks the end of an era, and as the public mourning for the Queen wraps up, it's time to have a yarn about nation building. Globally, these conversations are igniting Republican movements and also here in Australia. Our process starts with truth telling, but also, more importantly, truth listening. There are many things we can do today to make a difference by legislating, legislating the UN Declaration Rights of Indigenous Peoples Bill to protect free, prior and informed consent for First Nations people against the continued exploitation. Implementing the recommendations of the Bring Them Home report and Death in Custody report and progressing our own national treaty. As Queen Elizabeth Windsor believed in something bigger than herself, I want to today quote her words. It is through this lens of history that we should view the conflicts of today and so give us hope for tomorrow. We in this chamber should reflect on these words as to whether we are here for something bigger than ourselves. Today, together, this parliament can chart a new course for all Australians for that tomorrow. With one of its own, as an elected head of state, where First Nations sovereignty lies along the legal embodied sovereignty of this nation's constitution. Right now, we have the greatest opportunity for renewal and growth of this nation that we have ever known. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I'd also like to join my colleagues here in the Senate today in expressing my deep condolences on the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I was pleased to be in the parliament yesterday for the National Memorial Service for Her Majesty. It was a moving and fitting service that conveyed the grief felt right across Australia upon the death of the Queen. She represented so many of the values that we treasure uh, in Australia. She carried herself with a quiet dignity that made her public contributions all the more meaningful, and carried out her duties as Queen of Australia with a steady determination for the longest reign in history. The Queen's affection for Australia has been well documented, and I believe that Australians are proud of the special place our country held in the heart of our late sovereign. She visited Australia on 16 occasions, and I am sure many of us have been going back over old footages and old documents of the tours since Her Majesty's passing. I still find the huge crowds and their adoration quite striking. It's been evident over the past two weeks that this has not faded over time, as Australians from all walks of life have expressed their deep sorrow. During what would sadly be her last visit in Australia in 2011, the Queen spoke of how Australia had grown since she first came here in 1954. She said that Australia, and I quote, has made a dramatic progress economically, in social, scientific and industrial endeavours and above all in self-confidence. I believe that this speaks to Her Majesty's admiration and affection for our country, but also to how she viewed our progress as part of the Commonwealth. In her view, there was no conflict between Australia becoming more modern and self-confident and her relationship with us as our sovereign. This represents her approach throughout her reign. She never held back the progress of any nation. 
and in fact welcomed and encouraged innovation and changes that have shaped the world into the one that we now know today. A very different world to when Elizabeth II first became Queen in 1952. Australia certainly looks very different today, with families from all over the world coming to call this great country of ours home since the Queen session. I know many of us from migrant families have been deeply affected by Her Majesty's passing, even though they may have come from countries with no relationship with the Queen, swearing allegiance to the Sovereign when attaining their citizenship was for many migrants here in Australia part of the most important day of their lives. This was certainly the case for some of my family who were always fond of the Queen since they came to Australia and migrated from Italy. For many migrants, particularly those from war-torn countries, the Australian system of government with a British head of state was a representation of stability with its processes providing the transparency in the application of state power that is lost on so many parts of the world. She reigned for 70 years, the longest of any British sovereign in history. And I read recently that 94% of the world's population was born during her reign, an extraordinary number. It is not surprising that so many around the world, and especially in Australia, saw her as a source of strength and certainty, in addition to her personal attributions of kindness and compassion. Of course, Her Majesty was also a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, in addition to her role as Queen. So I want to particularly express my condolences to the royal family, to His Majesty, who must process their personal grief while shouldering the burdensome processes of state that followed the death of a sovereign. A long life devoted to duty, to family, to faith and to service has come to an end. And I know that right across Australia, we will all grieve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. May she rest in eternal peace and may God save the King. Senator Davey. Well, how do you condense 70 years into five minutes? Indeed, the Queen's service goes beyond her reign as monarch. It, it began the minute she became heir at just 10 years of age, and it continued still undertaking formal duties right up to two days before her unfortunate passing. Indeed, that is why her passing was such a surprise to many. And she was Queen of Australia, and her links to Australia and her attention to Australia started very early in her reign. She was the first and, st and only reigning monarch of Australia to have set foot on Australian soil. Her father was yet to become king when he visited Australia to open the first camp parliament house. From her first visit to her 16th and last visit in 2011, she made sure the regions were as integral to her itinerary as the capital cities. Her acknowledgement of all of Australia and all Australians is why she was so widely loved and respected throughout the nation. The outpouring of grief and the enormous sense of loss that has been felt by Australians from all walks of life, from those who merely saw her passing by to those who had the honour of meeting her. Her first tour in 1954 set the standard for her future visits, starting in Sydney and finishing 58 days and 57 towns later in Fremantle. During that tour, she visited every state and territory across the country by train, plane, ship and car, and much of it was spent in the regions. In New South Wales alone, she visited Casino, Lismore, Dubbo, Wollongong, Bathurst, Lithgow, Katoomba and Wagga Wagga. In fact, Her Majesty toured the northern New South Wales rivers just days before the horrific 1954 flood disaster. 
Thousands stood in the rain to see her, and when she left, the region turned into survival mode, as they have been in much of this year, as the Richmond River peaked at 13.4 metres. Her visit to Bathurst in 1954 lasted just 75 minutes, yet it has, is still heralded as one of the greatest days of that town. Such was her enduring presence. Her visits often coincided with great events. The 1970 royal tour at the time of the bicentenary of James Cook's voyage, 1973 opening of the Sydney Opera House, the 1988 opening of this building. Her visits recognised our economic drivers in Australia. She toured mines, steelworks, farms. She spent days inspecting and learning about the Snowy Mountains scheme. She visited the Great Barrier Reef, one of our tourist meccas. In fact, the Queen probably visited more cities, towns and institutions than most Australians. Of all of her enduring strengths and commitment is her commitment to service. Here was a woman who understood that to lead was to do. I was especially in awe of her keenness to contribute to the war effort, even as a teenager. First, speaking to children of the war via the BBC Radio's Children's Hour before enlisting in the Auxiliary Territorial Services, the women's branch of the British Army, when she turned 18. She trained as a mechanic and vehicle maintenance worker, and it is said she kept that keenness for driving engines throughout her life. And I vividly remember when I saw photos of a young queen, our queen, in army greens, changing tyres on a military vehicle. I knew if she could do it, I could do it. So when I turned 18, I joined the Australian Army Reserves. I was also lucky enough, as a young backpacker in London, uh, working at the Dorchester Hotel in the banqueting section, to work at a state banquet attended by the Queen. She made a point of acknowledging and personally speaking to every member of staff at the event, something many other celebrities that I served during my time there never did. She was our Queen, our head of state, but she was also a wonderful mother, a grandmother, a wise counsel, a leader dedicated to service for over seven decades. And we are all truly blessed to have been part of this period in history, the second Elizabethan era. And she will be warmly remembered, respectfully and sadly, for generations to come. May she rest in peace and long live the King. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. We reflect on the life of the Queen today from stolen Ngunnawal and Ngambri land, and I pay respect to their elders and to all First Nations peoples across this country, including those in our parliament with us here. Queen Elizabeth was loved by millions around the world. And as the BBC said in their obituary to her, the long reign of Queen Elizabeth II was marked by her strong sense of duty and her determination to dedicate her life to her throne and to her people. And I send my love to her family and to all who are mourning her passing. Elizabeth became queen eight years before I was born, and I remember hot summer afternoons as a child, browsing through large format picture books of her coronation and her visits to Australia in 1954 and 1963. My school friends and I would daydream about marrying Prince Charles and becoming a princess and then queen. God Save the Queen was our national anthem. The Queen's portrait was in our schools, beaming down benevolently on my life of white, middle-class privilege. God was in his heaven, the Queen was up there on the wall, and all was right with the world. So it's no wonder that Australians like me, products of white settler colonialism, products of empire, of stolen land, are mourning the loss of the Queen, grieving because their loved monarch, at the apex of the suite of institutions that structure our lives, has passed on and I truly respect that grief. But we have to look beyond this grief to the experiences and feelings of people who weren't 
and aren't part of this privileged group. Queen Elizabeth was, by all accounts, an intelligent and thoughtful woman, a woman who surely felt that she was working for justice and for peace, who surely felt that being truthful was a virtue. And the big truth that I'm sure she would have agreed with is that not everyone did so well out of the settler colonialism that she and her forebears presided over and still preside over. Indeed, Senator Pat Dodson has described how his grandfather, Yarrawoo leader Paddy Jegween, asked the Queen in 1963, why can't we have the same rights as the white man? And that the Queen promptly agreed and indicated her wish that he be given full citizenship. Yet at this time, Australia, the country she was head of state of, was stealing kids from their families, was ripping culture and communities apart, and is doing so to this day with thousands of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care, not living with relatives or friends or Indigenous caregivers. Uncle Archie Roach was the same age as my elder sister. While we grew up with our parents' love, knowing our place in the world, his world, like so many others, was ripped apart. We were white, they were black. And now, while my kids have had the opportunities to enable them to launch off into satisfying lives of their own, too many young black men their age are locked up in prison. Boys as young as 10 attempting suicide in youth prisons, and deaths in custody still occurring with sickening regularity, with the latest young man dying just days before the Queen passed away. Yet where is the outpouring of grief for him? Where is the commitment to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission, still as relevant today as they were 35 years ago? The Commonwealth that the Queen presided over was and still is inherently racist. Our Australian nation is based on a lie of terra nullius that at its heart said that our First Nations peoples are inferior to the invaders. We stole their land. We killed thousands in frontier wars. We didn't even attempt to sign treaties. And the war and the genocide is ongoing. The imprisonment, the taking away of children, the stealing and the desecration of land with coal and gas mines and the destruction of forests and totem species from logging. I'm saying this here today because those of us who have benefited from our racist system need to speak up. I was proud to join the protest yesterday because to be silent is to consent. We need to keep on speaking up until justice is done, until we have faced the truth of our history, which is still resonating loud into the present, and to commit to moving genuinely forward together. So condolences to the Queen. But let's make our condolences productive and just. Let's work so that a legacy of the Queen's passing is the prompting of non-Aboriginal Australians to commit to using our privilege to work for truth-telling, peace and justice. Australia's First Nations people need more than a voice. Australia needs truth-telling starting here in this place. We need justice. We need treaties. We need a republic, that is an Australia that has First Nations justice and First Nations wisdom at its core. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise on this motion to offer my sincere condolences to all those mourning today. In 1970, Queen Elizabeth II visited Victoria. There's a great photo of her meeting with Aussie rules players from the Fitzroy Football Club uh, at the MCG. This was the first ever Sunday match put on by the league to honour the royal family. In the photo, the Queen is smiling warmly and widely. The players sport magnificent coiffed hair and sideburns, as was the fashion of the day, with not a single mullet or tattoo sleeve in sight. There's a few likely lads in the lineup offering some cheeky grins as they greet Her Majesty. It looks to have been a great day. Victorians turned out in extraordinary numbers. Many thousands welcomed the opportunity to see the Queen back then, just as they are now embracing the opportunity to pay their respects at this time. This country has seen a lot of change since that day in 1970. Throughout the decades since, the Queen's dedication to public service never wavered. Today, I recognise her life of extraordinary service. I recognise her as a model of discipline and duty, and I recognise the grace with which she performed that duty. 
a grace often punctuated with doses of wit and good humour as well. I offer my sincere condolences to all those mourning her loss, those in Victoria who remember her 11 visits to our state, those who may have been amongst the estimated one million people who lined the streets of Melbourne in 1954 just to catch a glimpse, those mourning across the country and those across the seas as well. Much has changed in our nation since that photo at the G in 1970, and the passing of the Queen has made us think again about who we are as a nation. I acknowledge again today the Ngunnawal people on whose land this parliament sits and the generous hand of reconciliation extended at yesterday's memorial service by Ngunnawal elder Auntie Violet Sheridan. I recognise the long march of First Nations people towards recognition and respect for community, culture and country. This is a time to reflect on an extraordinary life lived in public service and an opportunity to reflect on the solid and strong foundations upon which we can build our nation's future together, walking side by side. Solid foundations of respect for First People, strong foundations of pride in the multicultural nation we've become. This future is in all of our hands. It is ours to make and to make well. I offer again my sincere condolences to all those mourning today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It was indeed an honour as a member of this Senate to attend the National Memorial Service for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in the Great Hall of our Parliament yesterday. Her Majesty's passing marks the end of an era, and it is right that we as a nation and individually pay our respects and record our grateful thanks for Her Majesty's lifetime of service, dedication and commitment. Mm -hmm. Her role asked a great deal of her. And she met that asking and exceeded it for over 70 years. A calm, principled leader, a woman who particularly as head of the Commonwealth led in her own measured and considered way. I've been thinking about the development of the Commonwealth during the Queen's reign in many ways, its constancy and her equally constant and steadfast leadership. On her first international visits as Queen, in her Christmas message of 1953, delivered from New Zealand, Her Majesty said of the Commonwealth, it is an entirely new conception, built on the highest qualities of the spirit of man, friendship, loyalty, and the desire for freedom and peace. It was also in a speech to the nations of the Commonwealth on her 21st birthday in 1947 that the then princess made her oft-recalled commitment to service, dedicating her whole life to the service of the peoples of the Commonwealth and its family. She spoke on that day of her love for the ancient Commonwealth, but importantly, fully recognised in looking forward to the new post-war world, that the new Commonwealth would be a different shape, with a focus on the future and indeed on peace. This view was reinforced as both her engagement and her knowledge grew, and as in the ensuing years her travels took her to more and more Commonwealth nations. Her Majesty is particularly much loved across the Commonwealth countries of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. As well as Australia and New Zealand, on that tour in 1943, Her Majesty visited, visited Tonga and Fiji. Following travels took her to Tuvalu, to Kiribati, to the Cook Islands, to Nauru, to Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, and of course back to the Pacific multiple times throughout her reign, including her 16 visits to Australia. Notably, whilst in Vanuatu in 1974 on the island of Tanna, Ni Vanuatu there formed the view that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh was a divine being. I like to imagine the amusement that that may have generated in private moments between Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh, especially given all we know about her warm sense of humour. I acknowledge and thank Her Majesty for her leadership of the Commonwealth, particularly through very difficult times in very many member countries. It has also struck me in recent weeks as literally thousands and thousands of photographs of Her Majesty have covered our pages and our screens. But many of the warmest and happiest of those have been of the Queen, with her family, of course, but also with her beloved animals, mm -hmm. with her dogs, both corgis and doggies, and her horses. Horses at the Royal Windsor Horse Show, at Royal Ascot, 
her distinctive purple and red colours worn so proudly by jockeys, including here in Australia, and most recently, ridden by, most recently on Chalkstream, ridden by leading jockey James MacDonald in Chris Waller's stable. Her own much-loved Carlton Lima Emma, still ridden by Her Majesty into her 90s, and as Senator Cash reminded me, Emma beautifully joined the long walk this week. Records tell us that Queen Elizabeth won every classic race except the Derby at Epsom. She celebrated 24 Royal Ascot winners as an owner, including the 2013 Gold Cup. I loved watching her warmth and love for the horse, as often those photographs were taken when she was unaware and at her most natural. I also want to note Her Majesty's strong commitment to the armed forces, not, ju not just those of the UK itself in her own role, but across the Commonwealth. There have been many stories recorded in recent weeks, but today I want to acknowledge the extraordinary service of the bearers, who in these recent weeks have taken care of Her Majesty as she made her way to her final rest, from Balmoral to Edinburgh, through London to her resting place in King George VI Memorial Chapel in Windsor with her beloved Prince Philip and her parents. They have taken such great care been professional to the utmost in the execution of that responsibility with their precious burden. I've watched their faces, seen the emotions passing across those young defence members and admired their solemn dedication and strength. I acknowledge Her Majesty's lifetime of leadership and dedication, her great love for family, and convey my sympathies to His Majesty, the King Charles III, the entire royal family and all the peoples of the Commonwealth. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator Ullman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to give my condolences on the death of Queen Elizabeth II and to extend my sincere th sympathies to her family and those who knew her personally. Elizabeth Windsor became the Queen of Australia in 1952 and reigned for 70 years. During that time, extraordinary changes occurred in our nation and in our, her empire. Many colonised nations sought and achieved independence, and many more signalled their intention to break from the United Kingdom. Australia has made significant progress in the past 70 years, but many things remain unchanged. We still have no treaty with First Nations people and we remain constitutionally wedded to a foreign power with an obscenely wealthy, legally immune head of state who is not Australian, a position entirely inherited and unearned. The Queen was by all accounts a friendly, hard-working, determined, diligent and charming person, and her passing is felt keenly by many. But as my colleagues have noted, she was still the head of an empire that violently colonised much of the world, including the First Nations people of this continent. First Nations people have never ceded sovereignty over their lands, seas and waterways. They were massacred, their lands and children stolen and their connection to country denied. Elizabeth Windsor did not personally commit these crimes, but her empire and her country did. And she accumulated vast wealth from the historical and ongoing exploitation of country. The office of head of state is not without blame for the colonisation of Australia. Australia now has a king, Charles Philip Arthur George Mountbatten Windsor, a 73-year-old Englishman, has become King Charles III King of Australia. We had no say in this. The hereditary powers of the monarchy simply transferred from one person to another. We have been told that critiques of hereditary rule at this time are inappropriate, that it is disrespectful to suggest that Australia seriously consider its independence from the empire during a period of mourning. But now it is the perfect time. Throughout the Queen's reign, many nations achieved independence from Britain some peacefully, others fighting against colonial forces to achieve it. Now that the Queen has passed away, the time is right for Australia to have a full and frank conversation about the kind of nation that we want to be. 
While Australia chose not to pursue independence 23 years ago, it is time for us to have that conversation once again. Australia should have its own head of state. We should have a head of state that is representative of Australia and its people. Their office should be respected and remunerated, but it should not be lavished with public funds, which are then turned into private wealth, as the monarchy is. Australia should have a treaty with First Nations people. We should have a treaty that, as my colleague Senator Thorpe has said, finally ends the war against First Nations people and moves Australia forward as a nation together. The passing of Queen Elizabeth marks the end of an era and represents a moment of opportunity for Australia. We could choose to remain tethered to a foreign country, pledging fealty to an unelected monarch presiding over a dying empire, or we could act with the kind of courage and dignity for which many praised Queen Elizabeth II and seize this chance to chart a new course. Treaty now, Republic now. Thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Senator Green. Thank you. Today, the Australian Parliament sits to express our condolences at the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. After her, an historic reign of 70 years, Her Majesty was laid to rest on Monday and honoured with a memorial service here yesterday. As the first reigning British monarch to visit Australia, Queen Elizabeth II holds a unique and significant place in our national identity. Through her reign, Her Majesty visited my home state of Queensland a total of eight times. Each visit was marked by the turnout of thousands of well-wishers, particularly in regional Queensland, where some people travelled hundreds of kilometres to get a glimpse of the pomp and ceremony. Only a year after her coronation, Queen Elizabeth uh, the second undertook an extensive tour of Australia with a significant portion of that tour spent in regional Queensland. Through Bundaberg and Toowoomba all the way through to Cairns, Her Majesty saw vast waves of Queensland's landscapes and communities. Thousands of people welcomed Her Majesty in Townsville, which she called a beautiful city. Similarly, she addressed unprecedented crowds in Cairns, so many, in fact, that one of the temporary stands built in Parramatta Park collapsed. Her Majesty's tour of regional Queensland was rounded out with short trips to Mackay and Rockhampton, where she expressed her sympathies with communities who had been affected by recent flooding events. Reflecting on her tour, Queen Elizabeth II said she was leaving Mackay with a deeper understanding of North Queensland, its peoples and their way of life. On her tour in 1970, Queen Elizabeth II saw more Queensland's diverse geography, doing both an inland and coastal tour. In her first leg, Her Majesty visited inland locations such as Longreach, Cullamulla and Mount Isa. In Townsville, she was central to an important part of local history, giving royal assent to the official establishment of James Cook University, a place where Eddie Marbo would go on to study law. Of special importance in my role as Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef, I want to acknowledge that Her Majesty, accompanied by Princess Anne, visited the Great Barrier Reef and had the opportunity to see for herself the magnificent natural wonder with a visit to the underwater observatory on Green Island. She also touched the lives of people in Cairns and Mackay as she held short but impactful visit to both of these cities. While on a shorter trip to Queensland in 2002, Queensland, Queen Elizabeth and, um, made an impactful visit to Cairns. Her Majesty launched the Royal Flying Doctor Service aircraft in Cairns Airport and visited the Jabakai Aboriginal Cultural Park. She also toured some well-known landmarks the Sky Rail and the Cairns Port Authority. Over her 70-year reign, Her Majesty met many politicians. She would have seen the best and the worst type of politics, of service and of duty. Politics, service and duty at its best recognises the existence and the necessity of duality and compromise and that absolutism is the enemy of that good type of politics. We can do two things today during this period of reflection. We can pay tribute to an incredible woman who lived an incredible life and played an important role in our nation. We can also acknowledge that in this country, 
sovereignty was never ceded and a treaty was never signed. We can do these two things respectfully and dutifully. The privilege of service was bestowed on Queen Elizabeth by her birthright, and it is one that she never took for granted. The privilege of service is bestowed on us as senators by the Australian public. May we never take that for granted. As a senator for Queensland, I express my condolences to Her Majesty's family and all of those who grieve her passing around the world. May she rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to join this commemoration of a remarkable woman with a remarkable faith and to pay my respects also. In the days since Her Majesty's passing, many who have studied the late monarch's life closely and indeed those whose only interaction was perhaps through mainstream media have made the observation that she was truly one of a kind. A source of wise counsel, a beacon of stability and constancy, a compassionate woman and one of the greatest leaders of our time. From the very beginning of her adult life, Queen Elizabeth II made a promise to dedicate her whole life to the service of the nation and of the Commonwealth, as she stated in her 21st birthday broadcast, words with which we are all now so very familiar. Many leaders make promises and so many in a human way break them. But this promise made by the late Queen was so remarkably kept in an unrelenting and unflinching manner. She was an exemplar of leadership we so rarely see. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, in his sermon at the funeral service for Her Late Majesty, told us how and why the Queen could keep this promise. He said, and I quote, Jesus, who does not tell his disciples how to follow but who to follow, said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Her late majesty's example was not set through her position or her ambition, but whom she followed. The Archbishop so clearly outlined for the rest of the world what it was that enabled the late Queen to fulfil her commitment for the entirety of her life. He went on to say, in 1953, the Queen began her coronation with a silent prayer. Her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. Her service to so many people in this nation, the Commonwealth and the world had its foundation in her following Christ, God himself, who said that he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As the biographer Dudley Delft said in his book, The Faith of Queen Elizabeth, which was written before her passing, the ability to keep a commitment seems to depend on the depth of conviction on which it's based. For Queen Elizabeth II, her beliefs are deeply rooted not only in the history and tradition of the British monarchy, but more importantly, in the word of God. And the late Queen herself made the point in the General Synod inauguration address in 2010 that she delivered, and she said, at the heart of our faith stands not a preoccupation with our own welfare and comfort, but the concept of service and of sacrifice. The late Queen's faith also played a leading role in her compassion and her care for the community she led, along with such outwardly apparent Christian respect. Queen Elizabeth II also exhibited humility, along with so many other characteristics we all yearn to see in our leaders born out of her faith, such as self-restraint and moderation. In a world where self is increasingly becoming more important than community and service to others, Her Late Majesty continued to implore her, uh, her subjects to keep things in check. In her 1991 annual Christmas broadcast, the late Queen said, let us not take ourselves too seriously. None of us has a monopoly on wisdom. It's a piece of advice that the late Queen clearly applied in her own life and her deliberations as evidenced by the selfless stability of her reign, pointing to her faith in God and his wisdom. Her late majesty offered such clarity and calm in her public addresses, and upon reading through many of them, much inspiration for those who want to make the world we live in a better place. The late queen often spoke openly and publicly of her faith, and I think it's the key to her success and the impact of her leadership. In her 2014 Christmas broadcast, it was clear for all to see. In that address, she said, For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life, a role model of reconciliation and of forgiveness. He stretched out his hands in love, acceptance and healing. 
Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value all people of whatever faith or of none. There's something for all of us to learn from the Queen's life. Those of us in this place who are leaders in our community and indeed everyone who was touched by the late Queen and her contribution to our world through her commitment to fulfilling her duties. Her late Majesty's faith was why she was the leader and the beacon that she was, living by example, fulfilling her duty with fidelity and adhering so unwaveringly to her Christian faith. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I too convey my condolences to His Majesty King Charles III and the royal family. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Pre uh, President. I rise to speak on this condolence motion for Queen Elizabeth II. I begin by passing on my sincere condolences to her family, King Charles III, and her other children. The grandchildren, her great grandchildren, and other family and friends. I'm sure this is a very difficult time for them, particularly when you are required to grieve so publicly and the grieving is broadcast and scrutinised around the world. I also acknowledge the genuine grief experienced by many in Australia, including so many in this chamber. It's important we respect the genuine shock and grief that this death has caused. Personally, I never met Queen Elizabeth II. It's no secret to anyone who knows me that I do not believe in the divine right of one person or one family to rule over everyone else by accident or by birth. But regardless, the loss of any human life should be respected. And when someone has passed, I believe you should talk about who they really were. So I commend the Queen's extensive support and charities throughout her life. She served as the patron or president of more than 600 charities and other public service organisations. In total, it's estimated she raised uh, billions of dollars for not-for-profits throughout her life. The Queen was also known to make significant personal donations to humanitarian causes, including causes supporting victims of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, the 2005 Kashmir earthquake, and the most recently to victims of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I also praise the Queen's firm opposition to apartheid in South Africa a political stance which put her at odds with the pro-apartheid Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Although she didn't always get it right, such as her reported opposition to the miners' strike. In reflecting on the Queen's death, I thought of the words contained in, within Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. These last two weeks have served as a reminder that this remains an aspirational statement. Over these two weeks of mourning and formalities, hundreds of thousands of people of equal human value as the Queen have died around the world. I am sure it has been particularly difficult to lose well up ones during this time and see the significance of their loss overshadowed by minute-to-minute -minute coverage of the death of the Queen. So I want to take a moment to pass on my condolences to the families of anyone who has lost loved ones recently, like the family of Uncle Charles, Jack Charles. Uncle Jack was a Boomerang, Jarajara Warang, Wararang, and Yorta Yorta man of tremendous artistic vision and talent. He was also a survivor of the stolen generations. That injustice was, of course, just one of the many perpetrated in Australia against First Nations peoples in the name of the Crown. This sort of severe trauma is transgenerational. So I can appreciate and emphasise with First Nations, empathise with First Nations, who may have rightly experienced very different emotions upon learning of this death. We should be a mature enough society to tolerate people with differing views rather than abusing or cancelling them. To that point, I'll end by quoting a recent contribution by Stan Grant on the grappling with reacting to the Queen's death. And I quote, my people have a word, Yindamara. Its meaning escapes English translation. It is a philosophy, a way of living, grounded in a deep respect. I have sought to show Yindamara to those for whom this moment is profound. This is their sorry business, and I respect that. But it will pass. For Indigenous people, our sorry business is without end. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's an honour to rise in the chamber today to speak to the condolence motion for the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The passing of such a significant and steadfast figure 
not just for Australia and the Commonwealth, but for the whole world, is a time of both sadness and reflection on an incredible life. I know that these sentiments will be repeated many times today, as they have over the course of the last two weeks, but the repetition of these words serves only to demonstrate the extent to which Her Majesty truly embodied them. Loyal, honourable, dignified, wise, dutiful and universally loved. Her Majesty has been the epitome of what it is and means to be a leader and a role model. Through wars, a global pandemic, economic depression and historic world changes, she has been unwavering in her stance and her faith. Queen Elizabeth II has been a pillar of stability and grace through for what is, for the most of us, our whole lives. She led unfalteringly with the knowledge that behind her was, in Her Majesty's own words, the living strength and majesty of the Commonwealth and Empire, of societies old and new, of lands and races different in history and origins, but all, by God's will, united in spirit and in aim. Perhaps what appears to me is the most significant quality of Queen Elizabeth II was that despite her title as Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of this realm and of her other realms and territories, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, she was loved and admired across the world. A global figure of warmth and compassion, despite the magnitude of her position. And that was represented in her own universal outlook, as Her Majesty said on the importance of peace. Whoever, whatever life throws at us, our individual responses will be all the stronger for working together and sharing the load. But of course, despite the far-reaching corners to which those who admire Queen Elizabeth II extended, it is clear that Her Majesty had a very special place in the hearts of the people of Australia. And equally, we know, as has been said many times through our period of mourning, that Her Majesty had deep affection for Australian and Australians as well. And this affection was undoubtedly extended to the people of South Australia, as demonstrated graciously on many occasions during her long reign. Among the Queen's many visits to our country, Her Majesty journeyed to my state of South Australia on seven occasions throughout her many years as Queen, including in 1954 to open a special session of the State Parliament and during her Golden Jubilee celebrations in 2002. The Queen's visit in 1954 took place just two years after her coronation, and her opening of the South Australian Parliament is marked as a day of singular significance in the state's constitutional history. During this visit, on Thursday, the 25th of March 1954, Her Majesty, along with the Duke of Edinburgh, arrived in Remmark, my hometown in the Riverland of South Australia. Standing on the Remmark Oval, a mere kilometre from the wandering River Murray, uh, Queen Elizabeth gave a speech to around 15,000 Riverlanders. Of those who had the privilege to meet the Queen on the Oval that day were my grandparents, Cuthbert and Marjorie Ruston. The photo of that meeting was a cherished possession of my grandparents all their lives, both being the staunchest of monarchists. I still have that photo. The Queen said, that her visit to Remmark will always remind us of what can be achieved by the use of natural resources in what must perhaps have originally appeared difficult and uncompromising surroundings. Her Majesty described the Riverland settlers having found a profitable and useful way of life on the banks of Australia's main waterways and having succeeded in harnessing nature's resources to achieve a wonderful result. The local newspaper, The Murray Pioneer, at the time reported the event as the district's greatest day. To me, it's a poignant example among a treasure trove of memories of Her Majesty's demonstration of her love for the Australian people and the Australian people's love for her. As a Senator for South Australia, to Her Majesty's family, I express my most sincere condolences. May Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of Australia, rest in eternal peace. Long live the King. Senator Billick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the condolence motion to mar mark the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. I do so as a senator for Tasmania, mindful that there is a range of views and emotions that may be being experienced by Australians and Tasmanians during this time, indeed across this chamber and the parliament. 
In my contribution today, I would like to reflect on some of the traits that I feel the Queen embodied. These are service to others, comfort and a determin determination to adapt to a changing world while trying to retain the essence of a position that went back a millennia. She embodied grace and dignity at all times, even through, as she called it, the Annus Horribilis. Her life was a life dedicated to service for so long and that, that it's rare. For 70 years as Queen and before then as Princess Elizabeth, she served her country and the Commonwealth. She was Australia's head of state for 70 of the nation's 121 years of federation. She carried out more than 21,000 engagements and travelled to more than 150 nations, primarily on behalf of the United Kingdom, but also on behalf of the Commonwealth of Nations and Australia. Her reign spanned 16 Australian Prime Ministers and included 16 visits to Australia. She visited my home state of Tasmania on a total of seven occasions in 1954, 1963, 1970, 1977, 1981, 1988 and 2000. And these occasions saw across our state, across the decades, streets lined with Tasmanians wishing to see and meet the Queen. Her good deeds extended to the support she gave to many important causes, and up until age 90, she was patron of around 600 different organisations. Through this support, she raised the profile of these causes, both large and small, and promoted them to the broader public, which allowed others in turn to give service to these causes. And it also enabled them to raise billions of dollars over the decades for their causes. Like Her Majesty, almost six million Australians volunteer each year, and I'm sure that many were inspired by Queen Elizabeth's example. Many have quoted recently the message she sent to the United States of America after the 9-11 attacks, where she said that grief is the price of love. But this condolence was just one of thousands that she conveyed to individuals and nations throughout her life. In response to the sadness and tragedy of others, she provided the most human of needs, comfort. She sought to bring nations and people together. It was this support to those that are hurting that we can reflect upon today. Queen Elizabeth II's life faced more change than any other monarch. The changes to technology and society during the 70 years she reigned were unlike anything any other monarch has faced. Never before has a monarch had to face up to the advances in technological changes that Queen Elizabeth II had too and how they shaped public perception and changed the role. While over many decades of her reign, she herself changed, Australia itself changed rapidly and in fundamental ways. Australia's population was just 8.6 million in 1952 compared to the 26 million today. And we've moved from a nation that was mostly homogenous Anglo-Celtic to one of diverse multiculturalism from all parts of the world with different traditions and cultures. Australians have gone from being isolated from the world to being able to travel freely and receive news and information instantly. On Monday night Australian time, the Queen's funeral was held in Westminster Abbey, and it's estimated that four billion people watched the broadcast, making it the most viewed broadcast of all times. This, I think, is a measure of the affection that Queen Elizabeth II was held in, not just in the United Kingdom nor the Commonwealth of Nations, but worldwide. There was something that all people of all nations could admire, the incredible, deep dedication to duty that she embodied. I'll end my contribution by remarking that there is something inexplicably missing now that she is gone. For most Australians, until her death, she was the only monarch we had ever known. She lived an extraordinary life, life which touched the lives of millions, gave comfort to many and provided an exemplary example of service to others. I extend my sympathies to her family, her children, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, who must be feeling her loss profoundly, and to all, around, all, around, to all those around our nation that are impacted by her death. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to pay a most sincere and heartfelt tribute to the life of the most extraordinary woman, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I do so as a Senator for Western Australia, as a senior officer in Her Majesty's Australian Army, 
as a former Minister of the Crown and member of Executive Council. So many wonderful and fitting eulogies and observations have been made about the Queen and her legacy, the legacy of the second Elizabethan era. Like so many others, I have been surprised at the depth of my sadness, of my grief, listening to and reflecting on these many tributes. On reflection, as a monarchist, that might not be as surprising, but it is easy to take for granted such a constant present in your life, one that has been so important to our democracy's stability. The past two weeks, for so many of us, have been ones of reflection, of admiration, of inspiration and gratitude for Her Majesty's selfless acceptance of her destiny and of her great responsibilities. We have all been reminded of the woman she was, the leader she was, the Queen's strength, her dignity, her kindness, her warmth, her great wisdom and, of course, her sense of humour. It has also been an important time to reflect on the lessons of the Queen's reign and to take inspiration from her life of leadership and of selfless service. She did not choose this life. Fate did. Queen Elizabeth was born in London in April 1926, the first born of the Duke and Duchess of York, born a princess but not a, uh, sumptive, presumptive. Her father, George VI, unexpectedly became king in 1936 upon the abdication of his brother, King Edward VIII, thus making Elizabeth, at just 10 years old, the presumptive heir to the throne. The course of her life became predetermined, a daunting challenge for any young woman of any era. It was a challenge, though, she rose quickly to, and one she maintained with great dignity and grace throughout her life. She led not only her nation, the United Kingdom, she also ruled a realm. And lead it she did. Her greatest achievements as a leader was in what we did not see, what she did quietly but persuasively behind closed doors. She was quite simply a magnificent role model for women of many generations. At 21, she married the love of her life, Philip, who was her constant stay and strength. Their 73 years of marriage was one of family, one of great joys, of great troubles and tragedies. But all played out, unlike the rest of us, in the glare of the media. The Duke loved and supported his wife, and he also selflessly served his queen. Elizabeth was only 25 years old when, in 1952, she became queen. In 1954, Queen Elizabeth became the first monarch to visit Australia, making 16 trips in all, including seven memorable trips to my home state of Western Australia. She loved and she respected us just as much we did her. During World War II, the Queen, then as a princess, was the first female member of the royal family to join the armed forces in a full-time capacity. Her great affinity, affection and respect for her armed services endured throughout her reign. No group of subjects have mourned her passing more deeply than those who served in her armed forces across the Commonwealth. She had great empathy for the many challenges faced by service personnel, by veterans and by their families. After all, she was a mother who sent her own children and grandchildren to war. She understands. Since Federation, Australia has had only five monarchs, with the Queen, with the Queen and her father, King George V, together reigning for the past 85 years. During the Queen's own reign, 16 Australian Prime Ministers and 16 Governors-General served in her name and have benefited from her great guidance, wisdom and the stability she provided. That stability cannot and has not been replicated under any other modern system of government or head of state. The unprecedented global outpouring of genuine grief is evidence of this. Madam Acting Deputy President, on her 21st birthday, Princess Elizabeth promised, I declare before all of you that my whole life 
whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Your Majesty, you have faithfully and selflessly kept your promise. This loyal subject thanks you. Your duties are done. Rest in peace with your beloved Philip, parents and your sister. Rest in peace and long live the King. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to join the Senate in marking the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Much has been said in this debate already about Her Majesty's extraordinary contribution, and I acknowledge the words shared by my colleagues today. Born in 1926, Queen Elizabeth II's life spanned nearly a century of rapid and substantial societal, economic and political change. Much has been made about the longevity of her reign, that she witnessed 16 Australian Prime Ministers from Menzies to Albanese. Her connection to and love of Australia was strong and it was enduring. But today I want to focus my remarks on her connection to my home state of South Australia, where she saw 15 different premiers lead our state. She visited my home state seven times over her 70-year reign witnessing the evolution of Adelaide into a modern, vibrant urban capital and the development of our thriving industries and, of course, the change to those industries. Befitting the longevity and significance of her reign, her presence will continue to be felt across my state through the landmarks of which she is namesake, including the suburb of Elizabeth and its surrounding satellites, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and the State Electorate of Elizabeth. The kindness shown by the Queen to our state in times of tragedy, like most recently the bushfires that tore through our state, have always been noted and appreciated by South Australians. On her visits to our state, she met figures who had their own impact on South Australia, from Thomas Playford taking her on a tour of the Holden factory to being accompanied by Don Dunstan as she toured the city of Adelaide, the city which was embracing an artistic and vibrant future. Through all of this change, the Queen was a constant, an enduring and reassuring presence through the rapid change of the past 70 years. It felt like she may just always be with us. As a little girl, I looked to our Queen fondly. She was a woman leading. So often, she was the only woman in the room. Indeed, when she came to the throne in 1952, there had only been four women elected to this chamber, two in the other place. Of course, it would be another 58 years before we had our own female leader in our Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. For all of my years, the Queen's authority as a woman in that role has been without question. And while for committed Republicans like myself, we cannot escape the fact that hers was a role born into, the fact that she commanded such respect, such love and devotion for her service and duty meant that she was a powerful role model to so many girls challenging the stereotypes around leadership, strength and who was worthy of being in the room. Now, as a working mother, I have deep respect for the way she managed her role so diligently whilst raising four much-loved children. Our thoughts are with her children and her grandchildren, indeed all who loved her and cared for her at this time. The mourning for Her Majesty has been felt worldwide. Of course, this has also been a time for reflection on the work yet to be done to reconcile the dark parts of our history with the harmonious future we seek to build together. We must no longer be a nation that it denies or ignores the truth of our past, and I believe we are sophisticated enough as a nation to speak and share the truth of our history while still being able to pay our respects to a remarkable woman. As we move beyond this Elizabethan era, I hope we can channel the values of duty, service and commitment to country and community that Her Majesty so steadfastly modelled. And here I wish to borrow from our Prime Minister in his words at the National Memorial yesterday, and I quote, Perhaps the greatest tribute we can offer her family and her memory is not a marble statue or a metal plaque. It is a renewed embrace of service to community, a truer understanding of our duty to others, a stronger commitment to respect for all. This would be a most fitting memorial to a magnificent life. May Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II rest in eternal peace. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Acting Madam President. 
As a senator for Victoria, I am humbled to rise and speak on this condolence motion to honour the extraordinary life and unparalleled service of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As Queen of Australia, head of the Commonwealth of Nations, Her Majesty was our Queen. The world may never see a monarch like her again. Ascending the throne at the age of 25, the Queen served our nation for 70 years and 214 days, the longest of any British monarch, with remarkable dignity and grace, deep integrity and an unwavering commitment to duty. While Australians mourn the loss of Her Majesty, we honour her devotion to faith, family and country. On the eve of her coronation on 2 June 1953, the Queen in a radio broadcast pledged, throughout all my life and with all my heart, I shall strive to be worthy of your trust. Her Majesty never wavered from this solemn promise. The Queen enjoyed a very special connection with Australia, visiting our shores on 16 occasions between 1954 and 2011. Her 11 trips to Victoria included watching the footy at the MCG, attending the races at Flemington, opening the 2006 Melbourne Commonwealth Games and visiting numerous regional towns and cities, including Geelong. Renowned for her sense of humour and her ability to relate to people from every walk of life, she won the hearts of millions of Australians wherever she travelled across our vast land. On her first visit, some seven million people turned out on the streets to acknowledge her passing, to acknowledge her passing through the streets, an incredible 70 per cent of the population. One of the most famous photos of the Queen in Australia occurred in Geelong in 1988, when she was photographed by Darren Lyons, who was then working for the Geelong Advertiser, throwing her head back in a gusto of laughter. The Laughing Queen, as the photo was called, captured Her Majesty's wicked sense of humour. As the story goes, she was laughing at the antics of a dog called Spud, which was wearing a wristwatch on its paw. The then Mayor of Geelong, Jim Fidge, asked the dog's owner, Peter Sharp, why the dog was wearing a watch, and he answered, so Spud knows how to go around the sheep clockwise. The Mayor then responded, but it's a digital watch, and at that point the Queen burst into laughter. Such was the Queen's affection for Australia that in 1966 the Queen and Prince Philip sent Prince Charles, as he was then, to school at Geelong Grammar's Timbertop campus near Macedon in Victoria. By all reports, Prince Charles adapted well to the arduous hikes in the mountains, the chopping of firewood to keep the boilers alight, and a solid dose of Australian schoolboy humour. And he has retained that very special connection with the great state I now represent in this place. During the same visit in 1988, uh, the Queen opened this building, the new Parliament House. As we heard yesterday at the National Memorial Service on the National Day of Mourning, the Queen acknowledged that her reign and the constitutional monarchy depended on the people she served. She said, a permanent home has been provided for Parliament, which is both the living expression of the Federation and the embodiment of the democratic principles of freedom, equality and justice. Parliamentary democracy is a compelling ideal, but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed and it is only too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and of their elected representatives to make it work. On behalf of the people of Victoria, I convey my deepest condolences to King Charles III and the royal family who have lost a mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. In his first speech, King Charles III honoured his beloved mother and pledged to serve with the same unswerving devotion, saying, thank you for your love and devotion to our family 
and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Rest in eternal peace, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Senator McCarthy. As Senator for the Northern Territory and the Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands, I extend my sincere condolences to the royal family on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. I also acknowledge the presence of the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, the Honourable Natasha Files, who has also joined us in representing the Northern Territory at this time in the mourning and commemoration of Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen visited the Northern Territory and at Cocos Keeling Islands and had such a fondness uh, in particular uh, for the Indian Ocean Territories. She visited on a number of occasions, in particular in Alice Springs, Catherine and Darwin, and left an excited impression on the many residents who had the opportunity to meet her in person or to be able to witness her presence on Aranda country and in the north on Larrakia country. It was the students of the School of the Air who were incredibly excited to be able to speak to the Queen and share their stories of what was happening across remote and regional Australia. It was members of the Royal Flying Doctor Service who could give evidence of just how difficult life was in the North. And even the St Mary's Football Club in 1977 had the honour of speaking to her personally just before their game. In 1963, the Queen and her husband visited Central Australia and had, she had been reportedly told that it was the dead heart of Australia. But the Queen saw Alice Springs on Aranda country as the living heart of the nation. Miriam Rose Bowman Ungumer visited London recently on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory and indeed the people of Daly River as a senior elder. Her first time overseas, she had mixed feelings, as I did, as many Australians did. I flew over my country, of the island country of the north of Borrelula, the day after the death of the Queen. As a Yanyo Garwa woman, I reflected quite deeply on just what it meant on a very personal level, not just as a senator for the Northern Territory, but as a Yanyo woman. I know my aunties felt sad. They saw the Queen as a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. I know my brothers felt differently. I know my uncles felt differently as we reflected too on what the monarchy has meant and what the world of colonialism has meant to the Yanua. And know deeply still the pain of the frontier wars and the conflicts that came with that. Maybe the Queen was not directly responsible for that, but we know that these are the mixed feelings and emotions of so many across the globe in the Commonwealth lands for First Nations people. And respectfully, one of the wonderful things that has come to this country is the Westminster form of democracy and the ability to be able to say and speak about what does matter to each and every person. And on this particular occasion, this solemn occasion as First Nations people, we know, certainly as the Yanyu and Garwa people know, that sorry business is very sacred business and must always be treated with respect. There will always be a time to talk about those things that have hurt in the past, and that time will come. But for now, we acknowledge the incredible memory of an incredible woman who impacted the globe and millions of people 
over seven decades or more. And the life that she gave and the service that she gave to her family, to her people and to those in Commonwealth nations around the, around the world. May you rest in peace. Thank you. Senator Mac MacDonald. A candle loses none of its light by lighting another candle. Like the ability of just one candle to light countless others, Queen Elizabeth was able to touch countless lives without ever dimming. This giving of her life freely without expectation embodies the character she showed as a royal and the seriousness with which she approached her reign. The Queen knew, Queen knew the crown was far more than an accessory. It is an important symbol, part of the protection for the fragile and important institutions of our democracy. For those of us who knew no other monarch, Queen Elizabeth II was a constant, a reliable beacon through our lives, a familiar touchstone of certainty, an anchor of dependability that has been lost. That loss during these changing times is felt keenly. She was also a paragon of womanly achievement ahead of her time, providing a role model to me as a serious leader, as well as a loving wife and mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, providing an example of grace and stoic leadership as she helped shepherd the Commonwealth through some of the most tumultuous changes in world history and also dealing with her own personal tragedies. The Queen commanded universal respect, not because she was powerful, but because she was genuine, genuinely interested in people, their cultures and their goals. From a young age, she showed a deep understanding of the power the royal family could have in boosting people's spirits. It is not it's impossible not to be moved by the genuineness in the then princess's voice as she spoke on UK national radio, encouraging children to be brave as they were sent away to escape from Hitler's bombs. These war year experiences no doubt set her resolve to commit to the unity of the Commonwealth and the importance of the defence of strong institutions and democracy. In 1970, she was drawn to the red earth and spinifex of Mount Isa in northwest Queensland, and my mother joined many others who had driven for hours on dirt roads for this most auspicious occasion, some from as far away as the Gulf of Carpentaria in Birdsville, both hundreds of kilometres away. I was in Mount Isa that day in a pram, not aware of the enormity of the moment, but I am glad to say I was there. A suite at the historic Casa Grande in Mount Isa was redecorated and refurbished especially for Her Majesty's visit, and she attended a rodeo and presented sports trophies to local school children. The Royal Flying Doctor Base in Mount Isa, Winifred Seaton met the Queen and was quoted in the North West Star newspaper as saying, I was amazed at the casual way she walked through the base and spoke to us. She was marvellous. The royal couple also visited Mount Isa Mines, an experience immortalised in the company's records with the statement, they came as guests and left as friends. It was this willingness to travel to important regional centres to see all her people that made her such a respected figure. That year, Queen Elizabeth also visited Townsville and gave royal assent to James Cook University, of which my grandfather, Sir George Fisher, was the first chancellor. Research indicates that at this time it was the only act of any Australian parliament to have received the personal assent of the reigning monarch, a rare event indeed. Townsville residents remember the 1970 and 1954 royal visits with great fondness. And it was in 1954 that Queen Elizabeth officially and somewhat controversially declared Townsville as the capital of North Queensland and remarked how strong and sturdy the children looked considering that Europeans had previously thought the climate too hostile for them to thrive. Annette Rowlings was in grade two in 1970 and said she was so excited to see Her Majesty she thought her heart would burst. Other smaller Queensland senators the Queen's visited included Longreach twice, Cunnamulla and Cooktown. On the Queen's 2002 visit to Cairns, local tourism pioneer Ken Chapman remarked to the Cairns Post we had international publicity for the whole region. That's why she did it, I suppose. Most things the Queen did. It was for the benefit of other people, and it was certainly for the benefit of Cairns. For many, Queen Elizabeth's passing was like losing a beloved grandmother. And for me, it was that and more. 
To me, the Queen embodied the perfect example of dignified servant leadership, genuine warmth, concern for others and intelligent, though understated, strength. May Her Majesty be forever remembered with the same deep fondness she showed Australia and her legacy be our continuation of the values and principles for which she lived. Long live the King. Thank you. Senator Polly. I wish to echo the people of Tasmanians' condolences on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen, our former head of state and leader of the Commonwealth of Nations. For most Australians, Queen Elizabeth II is the only monarch and head of state that they have known. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Sir Robert Menzies was the Prime Minister of Australia when Queen Elizabeth II ascended to the throne. She was a stoic leader who provided strength, continuity and dignity in an ever-changing and at times uncertain world during her 70-year reign. The Queen was always above politics, refusing to get involved in the daily rituals of political life, an attractive quality to the people of the world. Queen Elizabeth II represented a strength and resolve unmatched by any leader of the last century. I concur with the views that have been that no one else in human history that was as well mourned and mourned as much as Queen Elizabeth II because of her long reign and our modern forms of technology, whereby almost everyone on earth knew who Queen Elizabeth was and what she represented. During her time as sovereign, she executed her duties with the utmost of respect and diligence and with great grace. Queen Elizabeth II not only served in the armed forces but was the royal head of the British Army, Navy and Air Force. During the Second World War, she fixed and drove trucks while training others to do so. She later went on to christen battleships and visited military in, in garrison and in the field. As she was the first member of the royal family to serve on active duty during World War, time, World time, War time. Her Majesty was a consummate professional and she did whatever it took to get the job done and serve her people until her final hours. During her 70 years reign, Her Majesty visited Australia 16 times, making the trip to Tasmania seven times. She was the first reigning monarch to visit Tasmania and during her visits she spent time meeting Tasmanians in Hobart, Launceston and the northwest coast of Tasmania. She vi visited military barracks, attended community events and interacted with the public. I had the pleasure of meeting Her Majesty at that time uh, with her husband when she visited Launceston and I recall the visit in the year 2000 on the 29th of March. I assisted in the organisation to host Her Majesty at the Albert Hall and at City Park. I remember fondly the positive way Her Majesty and Prince Philip spoke of Launceston and Tasmania more broadly. They were extremely interested in Tasmania, its history and its people. They were forever engaging and really consummate dim, uh, dam, diplomats and leaders of her time. I, along with the world, am mourning her, and I believe we will be feeling her loss for some time. We are unlikely to see a leader like her again. She was unmatched and her contribution will not be forgotten. Her Majesty lived a life well lived, and the people of Tasmania thank her for all she gave us, her time, her energy and good grace. We may not see a Queen of England for decades with the current line of secession, which makes her legacy even more great. She never asked or expected to be Queen of England and the leader of the Commonwealth of Nations, but when she took the throne on the 6th of February 1952 until her death on the 8th of September 2022, she respected the office and protected it. My thoughts are with the royal family and the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth during this difficult time. I wish King Charles III good health and prosperity during his reign. We will remember Queen Elizabeth II for her commitment and dedication to serve to her family and to her faith. 
Rest in eternal peace. And thank you, Mum, for all that you have done for us. Senator Scar. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And it is a deep honour to rise to speak on this condolence motion, and in doing so, I deeply honour Her Majesty's commitment to duty, to service, and to Australia, which is an inspiration to each and every one of us. The death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has been a time for deep reflection. We reflect on Queen Elizabeth's service as Queen for 70 years and 214 days. We reflect on that period of service. And we remember, we remember that the Queen Elizabeth's life of service began even before her coronation. At the age of 13, in October 1940, Queen Prior to becoming Queen, Elizabeth broadcast a message to the children of the Commonwealth, many of whom had been evacuated from danger in the United Kingdom, to give them her expression of hope and a positive message. She did this at a time when Great Britain, Australia, Canada, the Commonwealth were standing alone against the evils of Nazi Germany. At the age of 16, in 1942, she attended her first formal engagement becoming a colonel of the Grenadier Guards. And at the age of 18, she joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the Armed Forces, training as a mechanic and driver. We reflect on how Queen Elizabeth discharged her duty and performed her services with compassion, with integrity, with dignity and with humour. And we remember that this was a role that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II had been born into it was not of her choosing. She had born into this role, into this position of deep responsibility. And in doing so, we should also remember that at the same time that Queen Elizabeth II bore these onerous responsibilities, she was also a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a sister, and had to withstand the great glare of public and media scrutiny throughout her time of service. Thirdly, we reflect on how Her Majesty was the Queen of Australia, not just in name but also in essence. And my good friend Senator Susan Macdonald referred to Her Majesty's visit to Mount Isa in northwest Queensland in 1970, when something like 20,000 Queenslanders across northwest Queensland descended on Mount Isa to catch a glimpse of the Queen and Prince Philip at that point in time. Just as in my own patch of Ipswich, in Ipswich City Council region, uh, something like 17,000 people from Ipswich turned out at Queen's Park to welcome the Queen and the Queen Mother when she visited that city in the 1950s. Our Queen was not just Queen of Australia, but she was Queen of her other realms and dominions. And in this respect, I would like to give a short personal reflection. Senators will know that I have a deep connection with Papua New Guinea, having lived and worked there for a number of years. And I can remember being with a client in Government House, a client from overseas, as we were getting some documents signed. And she asked me, uh, Paul, why is the Queen of England on the wall? And I said, this is not the Queen of England in this capacity. This is the, Queen's, the Queen of Papua New Guinea. And it is an extraordinary story as to how the Queen became the Queen of Papua New Guinea. As PNG journeyed to independence, there was a meeting of its first constituent assembly when its first elected officials came together as an assembly. And they chose, they decided, they invited Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II to be their queen. She was not imposed on Papua New Guinea. She was not retained by Papua New Guinea. She was actually invited by the elected representatives of an independent state of Papua New Guinea to be their queen. And that touched her deeply, and she discharged that obligation from the moment of that invitation to her passing. And that is reflected in Clause 82 of PNG's constitution. And no doubt King Charles III will also continue that role with great distinction. And I should note here that when he last uh, was in Papua New Guinea, he introduced himself uh, to the Papua New Guineans in Tok Pisin, uh, a local dialect in PNG, as number one Picaninny belonged to Mrs Queen. And with that sort of sensibility,
that sort of sensibility, I'm sure King Charles III would discharge his obligations to the people of, of Papua New Guinea with great distinction. Of course, King Charles III is now King of Australia. In discharging those duties, the King will be inspired by the example of his mother, just as all Australians have been and will continue to be inspired by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's example of dignity, compassion and service. May Her Majesty, our Queen, rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Urquhart. Whether you're a monarchist or royal watcher, or whether you support Australia becoming a republic, this is a time when we reflect on the life of Queen Elizabeth II. For those like me who were avid watchers of the Crown series on TV, I'm sure we all feel we have more of an insight into the life and times of Queen Elizabeth and her family. And whether our views lie, wherever our views lie, we cannot dismiss the extraordinary life of the Queen a life of privilege, marred with turbulence, sorrow, grief and many other emotions that most of us experience in our lives. She was a queen, a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, and those who loved her will of course grieve and miss her dearly. That extraordinary life really started when, at a very young age of 25 upon the death of her father, she became queen. She was the only reigning monarch that many of us will have known in our lifetime. My own mother was an avid royal watcher, and in fact, I think she had every Women's Weekly, every Woman's Day, or any other magazine that featured any one of the royals on its cover. I know that she would have been saddened by the death of the Queen. The Queen visited Australia 16 times from 1954 to her latest trip in 2011, and was the first British monarch to set foot on Australian soil. The first visit in February 1954 seen her greet over 70,000 ex-servicemen and women, drove in cavalcades with massive crowds, attended many civic receptions and opened the Australian Parliament in Canberra. During this tour, she travelled 10,000 miles by air and 2,000 miles by road, including 207, 207 trips by car and appointed royal trains. It's estimated as much as 75 per cent of our population seen the Queen and Prince Philip on this tour, a staggering feat indeed. I can recall at a very young age visiting Launceston to catch a glimpse of the Queen amongst the crowds. I think it was in 1963. Against, again, this would have been at my mum's insistence. And I met Queen Elizabeth at a reception in the Great Hall in October 2011 during her final visit to Australia. The Great Hall was, of course, packed full of people, and as she moved through with Prime Minister Julie, Julia Gillard, I was introduced to her. She had a love of animals and always had dogs by her side. She was gifted a corgi for her 18th birthday, named Susan, and according to some sources, Susan even joined the royal couple on their honeymoon. That lineage of breed continued for the next 80 years. However, Queen Elizabeth chose to stop breeding corgis after the death of her mother in 2002. It's also reported that the Queen had a personal cemetery built at Sandringham Estate, where every royal pet has been buried since 1887. She won the admiration of many Australians during her reign. People have marvelled at her unflagging service, and if you happen to look through the itinerary of a royal visit, the schedule is punishing, and to have maintained that type of schedule for 70 years is astounding. I am sure we all know now those famous words to Commonwealth nations on her 21st birthday that her whole life, whether it be long or short, shall de be devoted to your service. It's a promise that she kept. May she rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the motion of condolence on the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Overwhelmingly, the people of Australia, the Commonwealth and the world have noted the extraordinary service, good humour, humility and the wisdom of our late monarch, who devoted her life to the people of Britain, to the Commonwealth, as well as their institutions. As the Governor-General said yesterday, however, this has not been the response of all Australians, given the history of Australia as a colony of Britain. And it is true that throughout history, empires dating back from the Babylonian, the Greek, the Roman, the Ottoman, the Chinese, the German, the Japanese, the British and others have exercised dominion over other lands. 
In fact, the darker side of human nature has frequently seen stronger groups, whether linked by tribe, empire or ideology, subjugate the weaker, often with little or no regard for the impact on individuals. There has been an alternative thread to human history, however, which has found an exemplar in Queen Elizabeth II. And we see this thread emerging through individuals who devote their life to change. For example, in 1780, William Wilberforce became a parliamentarian in the UK who devoted his parliamentary life to ending the slave trade. In 1859, after the Battle of Solferino in Italy, Henri Dunant, a wealthy businessman who came across the wounded soldiers, the commoners left to die on the battlefield and organised care for them, created an enduring institution that we now know as the Red Cross. Born in 1820, Florence Nightingale saw the needs of the wounded in Crimea and saw the needs of the poor who didn't have competent health care and worked to develop the profession of nursing that would serve the ill, whether poor or rich. The common thread for these people was their Christian faith, which taught that every individual had intrinsic worth, was deserving of respect and should be free to make choices. And so in the funeral service of Her Majesty, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Justin Welby, gave us an insight into what motivated and sustained Queen Elizabeth II over the 70 years of her reign. He said, and I quote, In 1953, the Queen began her coronation with silent prayer, just there at the high altar. Her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. Her service to so many people in this nation, the Commonwealth and the world, had its foundation in her following Christ, God himself, who said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." End quote. Queen Elizabeth understood that to be truly sovereign, she must embrace human dignity, what we now often call human rights, and to live out her faith, not characterised by the power or privilege of her position, but by humility and service. Queen Elizabeth had come to know the lasting power of servant leadership that springs from faith in a God who values and cares for each individual. There has also been a thread, though, that has gradually changed the power structures in many nations. And the Queen recognised the value of the British institutions, and we think of the Magna Carta and the concept of habeas corpus, the freedom of the individual from the exercise of arbitrary power. And ultimately, the institution of parliamentary democracy with a separation of powers that gave people equality before the law and the freedom to have a say in who governs them. We must recall that Queen Elizabeth was a young adult during the horrors of war and the genocide in Europe, the air attacks on Britain and the threat of invasion by a totalitarian Nazi Germany. She would have listened to the Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the House of Commons in August of 1940, who said in part, there is, however, one direction in which we can see a little more clearly ahead. We have to think not only for ourselves, but for the lasting security of the cause and the principles for which we are fighting. And so in May of 1988, when an older queen came and opened this very Parliament House building, she said, and I quote, this is a special occasion for the Parliament, but it's also a very important day for all the people of Australia. After 87 years of federation, a permanent home has been provided for Parliament, which is both the living expression of that federation and the embodiment of the democratic principles of freedom, equality and justice. Parliamentary democracy is a compelling ideal, but it's a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed and it is only too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and of their elected representatives to make it work. Dedication to Australia and all Australians should characterise our work in this place if we are to lead by serving. Looking also beyond their shores as totalitarian powers are once again waging war in Europe and crushing democratic freedoms in places such as Myanmar, Iran and Hong Kong. We recall again from Queen Elizabeth's broadcast in April of 1947 her call to us. If we all go forward together with an unwavering faith, a high courage and a quiet heart, we shall be able to make of this ancient commonwealth, which we all love so dearly, an even grander thing, more free, more prosperous, more happy, a more powerful influence for good in the world than it has been 
in the day of our forefathers. It's a high calling, but one so critical in this hour of history. And so as we remember Queen Elizabeth II, give thanks for her faith and her life of service. Australians and we, as their representatives, can learn from and honour her through our choices, our attitudes and our actions. We can look back and recognise that the freedom to have our differences, to resolve them peacefully through parliamentary democracy, to respect each individual based on their character and inherent worth, are principles rooted both in our Christian heritage and the legacy of British law. We can look forward and recognise that a free and just future depends on our ability to think beyond ourselves and to act to protect and prosper the lasting principles and institutions that enable us to be one and free. We are thankful for the Queen's life of faithful service. She will undoubtedly hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, as she arrives home. Long live the King. Thank you. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to support of the condolence motion for the late monarch Queen Elizabeth II, commemorating her, her life, a life dedicated to service, service to family, service to people and service to the Commonwealth. I start my contribution with acknowledging the National Day of Mourning held yesterday, the 21st of September, where Australians across our great nation took time to pause, reflect and to honour the passing of Queen Elizabeth II in their own way. Here in Canberra, the National Memorial Service held in the Great Hall saw the coming together of over 600 guests to mark the death of Queen Elizabeth II, her life, her service and her reign. I do not have a personal story to tell about meeting the Queen. I did not have that honour. However, when I was about six years of age, I do recall in 1970 gathering with other students from my school, Warraine Primary, along the verge of Cambridge Road in Warraine, flags in hand, waiting, as we were told, for a very important person, the Queen, to come past. We were very excited, squealing in delight as the cavalcade of cars went by, and we caught a glimpse of whom we were sure was the Queen waving furiously and receiving nods and waves in exchange. A good day out for any six-year-old. Her Majesty visited Tasmania, Tasmania on numerous occasions. In addition to her seven visits to Hobart, she visited Launceston five times, Wynyard and Burnie twice. There were also visits to Devonport, La Trobe, Cressy and the Huon Valley. Indeed, the Queen stayed overnight in Cressy in 1954. School children and young people were always a strong focus whenever the, Her Majesty visited Tasmania, as were other activities that ranged from school athletics, carnivals, learning about our agricultural industries, participating in civic life and activities of the cities and towns of Tasmania and our volunteer community. During her 1988 visit, the Queen granted and proclaimed city status for Burnie in Tasmania's northwest. Burnie's quest to, be, to obtain city status became even more urgent when the town down the road, Devonport, gained city status in 1981 after a proclamation by the then Prince, by the then Prince Charles. Of course, the arrival of Her Majesty's vessel, the Britannia, pulled pulled alongside at Princess Wharf in 1963, marked another visit to Tasmania by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, and I imagine causing quite the buzz, buzz around Hobart. Today we pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth's remarkable reign of 70 years of dedicated service to communities throughout the Commonwealth. Her commitment to visiting Commonwealth nations throughout the world has contributed to the Commonwealth nation's unity of purpose and shared vision. In paying tribute, I also wish to acknowledge and reflect that for a lot of the time of Her Majesty, that Her Majesty was head of the Commonwealth, she was the lone woman. There were no female prime ministers, female presidents or female governor generals. Hers was a life lived in the public eye, with Commonwealth nations looking to her for strength and leaderships in time of conflict, challenge and trouble. A life of service and commitment 
until the very end, never deviating from war service to civic service, sitting alongside the many obligations and requirements as head of state. As Prime Minister Albanese said yesterday at the National Memorial Service, and I quote, Monuments to the Queen dot our landscape. The name of Elizabeth lives in nearly every town. Perhaps the greatest tribute we can offer her family and her memory is not a marble statue or a metal plaque. It is a renewed embrace of service to community, a truer understanding of our duty to others, a stronger commitment to respect for all. This would be a most fitting memorial to a magnificent life." End quote. On behalf of Tasmanians, I offer our deepest sympathy to King Charles III and his family for the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. May Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II rest in peace. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and offer my deepest condolences to His Majesty the King and the royal family for the loss of our greatest monarch. Queen Elizabeth was an exemplar of dignity and service. Her dedication to serving God and the Commonwealth is unprecedented, and she served her people with such humility and grace. Since our late sovereign's passing, the profound expression of underlying respect and heartfelt affection for her has been abundant. Her funeral was among the most moving occasions we have ever witnessed. The outpouring of emotion that has swept across Britain, the Commonwealth and indeed the world has been truly remarkable, a testament to Queen Elizabeth's long service and the indelible impression that she had on people's everyday lives is one that we reluctantly let go of. In 1952, upon the death of her father, King George VI, the young and radiant monarch ascended to the crown, ushering in a great wave of optimism and hope in a bleak post-World War. The preceding five decades had seen five different monarchs. Indeed, her own reign had not been initially foreseen. The great British statesman, Winston Churchill, who was her first prime minister, had a unique and deep bond with Her Majesty. Admiringly remarked in the sunset of his political days that never have the august duties which fall upon the British monarch been discharged with such, with such devotion. For most, Queen Elizabeth has been the only monarch in their lifetime. In a rapidly changing social and political world, just like the words of poet William B. Yeats, when things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, Elizabeth the Faithful cast a resolute shadow over the era of her reign. She was a shining symbol that bestrode and made history. For as long as history is recorded, there will always be the second Elizabethan age. Throughout her life, our late sovereign had a deep and personal faith in God. This solid Christian belief navigated her values for a lifetime. It was a faith manifest in both words and deeds. And aside from her formal role as the defender of the faith, her commitment to God sustained and guided her in daily application. Her late majesty's steadfast faith in God is exemplified in the first message that the Queen delivered at Christmas time, when she said, I want to ask you all, whatever your religion may be, to pray for me on that day to pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. Her unwavering reliance on God and a commitment to serving her people was a promise made when she was 21, a promise kept. Even in her final days, Her Late Majesty met with her 15th Prime Minister as monarch. Now, while Her Late Majesty was an abiding presence over the most transformative period in human history, one of her most endearing qualities was to connect with people from all walks of life, from heads of state to everyday citizens. In 2000, my great-grandmother, Min Crombie, 
and her sister, Auntie Nell, had the privilege of meeting her late majesty. Nana Crombie lined up in Bustleton for several hours to get a glimpse of the Queen passing by, only for Her Majesty to stop and, in noticing my family in the crowd, intentionally made her way over and greeted them. And my great-grandmother at the time was 87 years of age, and having already lived a full life, she fondly remarked that meeting Her Late Majesty was one of the greatest highlights of her entire life. Queen Elizabeth II's life and reign had an immeasurable impact. We are blessed as a nation to have been served so magnificently. So we give thanks to God for the life and service of our late sovereign. And on behalf of all Western Australians, I say to Her Late Majesty the Queen, thank you. Thank you for everything. Her passing marks the end of an era and the reign of our new sovereign, King Charles III, now begins. Long live the King. Senator Pratt. The outpouring we have seen in the wake of the death of Queen Elizabeth II is testament to just how remarkable her life was. As monarch, she dedicated her entire life to public service. And it is, you know, myself being 50 years of age, I have seen 50 years of that service. We've seen the sacrifices she has made to look and think beyond her immediate circumstances and focus firmly on the stewardship of her role as head of state, head of Australia and our head of state and as head of the Commonwealth. I admired her for her poise, the way she engaged with people, epitomising warmth, wisdom and humour in all her interactions. Queen Elizabeth II was focused and clear about her role as monarch and her role across uh, the United Kingdom, many Commonwealth nations, including Australia. I can't imagine what it must have been like to deal with her own father's unexpected death and become sovereign at just 25 years of age. And the strength and the resilience that she has shown in those 75 years since duly deserve the recognition uh, that Australia has bestowed on her in recent days. Her passing has left me to reflect on her public service and my own and indeed the privilege that this is. None of us are born into British royalty in this place. If we were, we should have to give it up in order to serve. But however humble or mighty our backgrounds are as members of this place, we are all enormously privileged to be here. And I was most moved by the gracious welcome to country by Ngunnawal elder Auntie Violet Sheridan and the procession of the Wiradjuri echoes yesterday. The Queen projected stability, permanency, and indeed she was informed and rightly apolitical. But here now in our nation, our young federation, we realise that we have a link not just to the British Crown and King Charles as our sovereign, but also an ancient, timeless and permanent cultural and political asset in our First Nations cultures. And it was wonderful to see that come together uh, in yesterday's ceremony. The Queen's personal gift was reflected on by Senator Dodson, and that was her ability to transcend that institution, embodying connection and hope for a better future. Kindness and resilience in all that she did. Many of the same values we are proud to call Australian. 
and Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth showed grace, dignity and brought timelessness to a role which has spanned an ever, ever changing period of time. My mother as a child took me to see Queen Elizabeth the second during the Silver Jubilee in 1977. She landed back in Perth Airport after visiting a number of Western Australia's towns. Over the years of her many visits to Western Australia, she visited Perth, but also Fremantle, Kalgoorlie, Bustleton, Albany, Geraldton, Northam, York, uh, West Swan, uh, and indeed has seen much more of the nation uh, than most Australians. Upon reflection, I know that my mother enjoyed seeing the Queen as a working mother much like herself. I and my sister, who was only two at the time, both remember to this day how quite upset we were when we had to hand over our garden flowers to a lady-in-waiting. I note that King Charles and Camilla are modernising the Crown and we may not see Ladies in, ladies in waiting as commonly uh, as we have. And here in Australian, Australia, we look now to the modernisation of our own federation with the Uluru Statement of the Heart uh, and indeed a new constitutional future. I myself enjoyed the pageantry of the Queen's funeral and once upon a time Australians would have identified very strongly as part of the empire. I'm proud today to know how far we have come while recognising how much further there still is to travel. In terms of bringing our First Nations culture into the heart of our nation and who we are, it is therefore even more remarkable to me that Queen Elizabeth has been such a key part of our national identity and our national journey and borne witness to these changes for the last 70 years. So with gratitude and fondness, I pay my respects to Queen Elizabeth II for her service to Australia. Senator Hume. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to lend my voice to the Senate's sympathy on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. My first experience with Her Majesty the Queen was in March 1977 also, when my grade one teacher uh, asked our class, all sitting cross-legged in front of her, whether any of us knew who the special visitor to Australia was coming this month. And I put my hand up because I knew, I knew, and I was joyful with the fact that I knew. Brian Naylor had said it on the, on the news the night before, and she called on me and she said, yes, Jane, do you know the answer? And I said, yes. Abba. And it was true, in fact, their tours did coincide. But in fact, perhaps uh, my, as a six-year-old, I, uh, I was not quite as appreciative at that time of the tireless work of the monarch as I am today. Nonetheless, the next day, I enthusiastically took my place along the nature strip of Dandenong Road in the blazing sunshine with thousands of other school children to greet Her Majesty as she drove by. It wasn't until 2011, however, that I was honoured to meet the Queen in person. I was at that stage serving on the board of Melbourne's iconic Royal Children's Hospital, and as part of what ended up being her final visit to Melbourne, she and Prince Philip joined us, opening the newly redeveloped facilities. They arrived, they toured the wards, they unveiled a plaque, they did all the right things, everything that was expected of them with smiles and with grace. And it's an image that we've seen on television so many times in the last couple of weeks. But being there that day, I could see that while all these duties were done with smiles and with grace, and while they were led around by very well-briefed and well-practiced board members and executives, more than anything, both Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip wanted to meet the doctors, they wanted to meet the nurses, they wanted to meet the patients of the Royal Children's Hospital. And they met them with an interest that was genuine and heartfelt. It was actually often difficult to, to recognise who was more thrilled, the person that was meeting the Queen or the Queen in meeting them. And those that met her on her many visits to Australia would tell you of a, a truly kind person, 
who would take a sincere interest, regardless of the cause, although I do think that perhaps this was particularly true for her patronage of the Australian Racing Museum in Caulfield, uh, just around the corner. The Queen's public service was not in any way or in any sense performative. It was truly authentic. How lucky we were to have a woman of such optimism and resilience and hope to be our Queen. Someone who shared in the hopes and aspirations for ourselves and for our country. Now, even the most self-confident person in this chamber uh, could commit, however lightly, to a promise of self-sacrifice for 70 years. That's an awful lot of elections. That's an awful lot of pre-selections. But the Queen kept that promise, a promise that no politician would ever dare make. And she did it, despite it all. She delivered it in spades. In Australia, under our constitutional monarchy, we have been gifted, gifted a head of state who is above personal ambition, who is above personal politics and above self-interest. But in Queen Elizabeth, we were also gifted a head of state that was never above the people. We saw that every time she visited and returned the respect and the warmth of those who met her. And through changes to our lives and to our society, the good and the bad, governments of both sides, passing trends and revolutions, the Queen stood still. She was a point at which we could look to, no matter how far we had moved, no matter how greatly we were shaken. And we could look to her and see certainty, and she looked to us and had faith and a warm belief in our strength and that of our country. She had the ability to see us with the understanding of resilience and limitless ability of each generation to overcome their own challenges and to endure and to build for the future. Certain, but not forever. In her last visit to Australia, the Queen reflected that we are all visitors to this time, this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. And in this time, we have been given a new head of state. King Charles III will provide a uniquely Australian perspective as the King of Australia. No other sovereign has the connection to our country or a personal appreciation of its idiosyncrasies. As some have reflected, his formative time in regional Victoria, and particularly at Timbertop in the community of Mansfield, was entirely without ceremony. And if my very strict deputy president will allow me a little bit of unparliamentary language, he was described by a classmate as no bullshit. I suspect a person who could see what life would uh, ask of him, that daunting, daunting promise of public service, found some freedom in that very simple life for a period of time. His time with us, as he came to be, become a young man, will give him a very deep insight into our national character. His own mother's public service will give him an appreciation for why we have such enormous respect for his role. And he will serve us with the same sense of duty. He will be beyond self-interest and beyond politics, but not beyond us. Because like our Queen, King Charles will share in Australia's hopes and aspirations and with an unwavering belief in us and in our country. Long live the King. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise on this occasion of the condolence motion to pay my respects to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, to acknowledge her lifetime of service and to also pass my condolences on to her surviving family. Her Majesty was beloved by her subjects throughout the Commonwealth for her deep sense of humanity, her selfless sense of duty and for her stable and enduring leadership. She did this in an era of upheaval and turmoil. To a tired world with an ever-growing and crowded chorus of raucous political players, her timeless grace and measured presence allowed her to ascend above the pettiness of politics and to become, by the end of her long reign, a paragon, the very essence of, of virtue. I have no doubt that her forbearance in the face of many and varied challenges Queen Elizabeth II uh, faced in her long reign were virtues grounded in her deep and abiding faith. As the head of the Church of England, she adhered to that faith. In the many described interactions the Queen had with people across the globe in her 70 years of leadership, she modelled a servant leadership 
that echoed the teachings of Jesus Christ, her Lord and Saviour. The love that the Queen received in her life and in her death from so many of her subjects, and indeed from those who admired her reign at a further distance, came from a quiet but resolute dignity. The Queen's tirelessness and the way that she carried on that life of service through so many national and personal tragedies gives us all a standard of public service that challenges us to be like her in that regard. In her personhood, which she so frequently must have subjugated to the Crown, she found joy and comfort in her love of corgis and racehorses, Balmoral in its wildness and connection to nature in all its majesty was clearly her, pace, her place of great comfort and considerable privacy. Much has been made with the Queen's sense of humour, mischievous but also, also self-deprecating. On her passing behind all the dutiful and stabilising adherence to tradition and protocol, behind the pomp and splendour, we do well today to remember that in the thousands of reported one-on-one -on -one interactions the Queen showed over and over again across seven decades that she was an unbelievably strong, resilient, sensitive and charming woman. As a female leader myself, I can only imagine how in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s, and indeed in some situations up to this day, she would have so often been the only woman in the room. She modelled in her Elizabethan reign the strength of women in leadership. None of us, not even a queen with faith on her side, lives a perfect life. We are all subject to the historical tides of our times. We rise and fall with them. When we are found wanting, time gives us the opportunity to change, to grow and become a better version of ourselves every day. The queen modelled that capacity to change and make the very different circumstances of her reign and the politics of the time. Her modelling of that insightful, reflective skill and capacity to see and adapt to meet these times is instructive. Embodying this skill and insult, insight will be important for our new monarch, King Charles III, as he encounters the political winds of change across the Commonwealth, including changes of sentiment about the future of constitutional monarchy here in Australia and political challenges in other jurisdictions. As a senator for the great state of New South Wales, I want to pass on my deepest condolences to Her Majesty's family as they cope with their loss. As much as Her Majesty was a model of dignity and grace in her leadership of the Commonwealth, I can imagine, only imagine how supportive, loving and kind she was to her own family and how deep and abiding their grief must be. I send my prayers to the royal family as they hold their loved ones tight in this sad period of mourning. King Charles farewelled his mother with a line from Shakespeare's Hamlet, May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest, referencing her faith and his hopes for her eternal reward. May I close with the words that have been said to be the main, a mainstay for Queen Elizabeth II from the hymn known as Crimmond based on Psalm 23 from the Book of Psalms in the Holy Bible. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me, and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. May Queen Elizabeth enjoy eternal rest in the arms of the Lord to whom she was servant all the days of her life. Senator Ratsky. Thank you. Today I join senators in offering my deep condolences to the royal family following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. When I stood to make my first speech in this chamber, I highlighted the dedicated work of the several women who had represented Tasmania in Canberra before me. Now I stand to speak about a woman who has not only served Tasmania, but our entire nation and that of the Commonwealth. Our Queen, the Queen of Australia, served with dignity, empathy, and wisdom for 70 years, and I wish to pay tribute to her life of service. Like us all here today, Queen Elizabeth has been the only monarch I have known. From the coins I carry in my purse, our $5 notes, the English breakfast tea that I enjoy, or to the portrait hanging in beside the national flag in my electorate office, I'm reminded of Her Majesty's presence every day. The Queen has been with us through wars, the pandemic, multiple Commonwealth Games and the opening of many significant buildings, including the one in which we are right now. Her reign spanned 16 Australian Prime Ministers and the same number of Governor-Generals, 
and during this time she visited every Australian state and territory. I was seven years old when Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh visited Launceston in 1970. This brush with royalty when I was a young child was brief, but the experience left an indelible mark on my memory. I found myself thinking about this experience over the past fortnight. It was a big event for my hometown and an even bigger event for my family. After joining the Queen for a civic luncheon at Launceston's Town Hall, my parents returned home and hurriedly packed my siblings and I into our car. My father drove us along the western side of the Tamar River so we could find the perfect position to catch a glimpse of the royals en route to their royal yacht. We waved excitedly as the Queen drove past us on her way along the river from Launceston to inspection head at Beauty Point, where the Britannia was berthed during the Royals' northern Tasmanian visit. The Queen also enjoyed the bicentennial celebrations marking Captain James Cook's voyage to Australia during her 1970 visit to Tasmania and unveiled a memorial plaque in Macquarie Street, Hobart on that occasion. This royal visit also included a visit to a Longley apple orchard so the Queen could see the state's primary crop firsthand, as well as ceremonial duties at the Royal Hobart Hospital and a visit to Launceston's race course for horse racing meat. We all know how much she loved an equine fix and the Tasmanians were only too happy to oblige our Queen. While the 1970 royal visit was exciting for me, her first visit to Tasmania after becoming Queen left a permanent legacy for Northern Midlands farming family, the O'Connors. When Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip visited my home state in 1954, the party stayed with the O'Connors on their sheep property Connorville at Cressy in the Federal Electorate of Lyons. The royal couple and their staff were hosted by May O'Connor and her son Rod. In recent days, the current owner, Roderick O'Connor, was interviewed about this historic visit and he had readily recalled some family stories. Such a momentous visit meant Roderick's grandmother and father had to extend Connorville to accommodate the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, their staff and equipment. Roads were also built on the property and around Cressy that were fit for a visit from a Queen. While visiting Connorville, the Queen planted a golden elm with May O'Connor, and this historic tree still has pride of place on the property today. A plaque was also erected at Connorville to commemorate the event. Besides the tours I've mentioned already, the Queen visited Tasmania six other times. In 1963, for her Silver Jubilee tour in 1977, and again in 1981, 1988, 2000 and 2004, which was her last visit to the Tasmanian shores. During several of these royal tours, Queen Elizabeth II planted trees at government's Tasmania's government house to mark her visits, including an oak, blue gum, silver birch and hewn pine. And earlier this year, members of the Royal Commonwealth Society planted a dawn redwood in the grounds of Government House to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Each of these trees, along with the golden elm the Queen planted with May O'Connor at Connorville, form a living memorial to our longest reigning monarch. They are fitting and symbols of her enduring vitality and constancy. Queen Elizabeth II will be, missed, excuse me, will be missed by many throughout Australia and the Commonwealth. I thank Your Majesty for a lifetime of service and acknowledge King Charles III on his accession to the throne. Long live the King. Mm -hmm. Madam Acting Deputy President, while I am on my feet, could I also please seek leave to table two additional speeches to be tabled from Senator Molan and Senator Brockman? Is leave, is leave granted? Leave is granted. So I'll table those. Thank you very much. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Um, I cannot hope to match the eloquent uh, words that have fittingly marked the passing of Queen Elizabeth II's remarkable life, so I will do something different and read into our parliamentary records the Queen's words as expressed annually through her famous Christmas broadcasts. The Queen's grandfather, King George V, started the Christmas broadcast in 1932. Queen Elizabeth has delivered 70 of the 90 Christmas broadcasts so far delivered. The constant theme throughout her broadcast were the timeless lessons of Jesus Christ's message of love, charity, hope, children, forgiveness and reconciliation. The Queen mainly delivered her broadcasts from her home and she made a point of stressing that Christmas was a time to spend at home among family. As the Queen mentioned in her first broadcast in 1952, I am speaking to you from my own home, where I am spending Christmas with my family. 
And let me say at once how I hope that your children are enjoying themselves as much as mine are on a day which is especially the children's festival, kept in honour of the child born at Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. The home was a constant theme, and the Queen stressed by 2017 that despite all the technological change changes, people were still listening or watching to her message at home. As she said on the 60th anniversary of her first television address, six decades on, the presenter of that broadcast has evolved somewhat, as has the technology she described. Back then, who could have imagined that people would one day be following this Christmas message on laptops and mobile phones? But I'm also struck by something that hasn't changed, that whatever the technology, many of you will be watching or listening to this at home. In 1957, the Queen gave that first Christmas broadcast by television. She remarked that many at the time felt lost by the speed of change, but she provided us advice on how to respond. But it is not the new inventions which are the difficulty. The trouble is caused by unthinking people who carelessly throw away ageless ideals as if they were old and outworn machinery. They would have religion thrown aside, morality and personal and public life made meaningless, honesty counted as foolishness and self-interest set up in place of self-restraint. Today we need a special kind of courage, not the kind needed in battle, but a kind which makes us stand up for everything that we know is right, everything that is true and honest. We need the kind of courage that can withstand the subtle corruption of the cynics so that we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future. Hers was a call for all of us to be courageous in defence of what was right, and the Queen often remarked that, in her view, it was the acts of many ordinary people that have to do this. In 1954, she said, In the turbulence of this anxious and active world, many people are leading uneventful, lonely lives. To them, dreariness, not disaster, is the enemy. They seldom realise that on their steadfastness, on their ability to withstand the fatigue of dull, repetitive work, and on their courage on meeting constant small adversities, depend in great measure the happiness and prosperity of the community as a whole. The upward course of a nation's history is due, in the long run, to the soundness of heart of its average men and women. The Queen made clear that this respect for all people was central to her Christian faith and leadership. She often mentioned the parable of the Good Samaritan, as in 2004. For me, as a Christian, one of the most important of these teachings is contained in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when Jesus answers the question, who is my neighbour? It is a timeless story of a victim of a mugging who was ignored by his own countrymen but helped by a foreigner, and a, sp and a, and a despised foreigner at that. The implication drawn, drawn by Jesus is clear. Everyone is our neighbour, no matter what race, creed or colour. The need to look after a fellow human being is far more important than any cultural or, cultural or religious differences. The, perhaps the best tribute we could make to, to the Queen is to recognise that she bore Christ's cross admirably and that she will be reunited with him now. Her leadership is best summed up by a prayer she mentioned in her 2003 Christmas broadcast. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and to not count the cost, to fight and to not heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not ask for reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. Vail, Queen Elizabeth II. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to add my remarks to reflect and give thanks for a life of service and to extend my condolence to the family of Queen Elizabeth II and all those who mourn her. Her Majesty, as has been well documented, has been a constant figure in the lives of over 90 per cent of the world's population, with particular pertinence to the nations of the Commonwealth. Her passing has given us all pause to reflect on the events of the period of her reign, the Elizabethan era. Her influence on those events and, of course, our own personal interactions with her, as significant or as insignificant 
as that may be. Uh, my first interaction was to be one of those less, in, less significant. I was to be part of a display of children at the North Hobart Oval in 1970. Unfortunately, it rained. The event was called off uh, and others got to wave their flags at her as she continued her tour around Hobart. Uh, so any close contact with Her Majesty was delayed for another 36 years when I had the opportunity to be part of a state dinner here in this place, to meet Her Majesty and to be part of a photograph that was taken in the marble foyer with then Prime Minister Howard and his ministry. Um, a moment to reflect and to savour. Tasmania hosted Her Majesty on seven occasions in 54, 1963, 1970, 71, 81, 88 and 2000. Uh, and as has been reflected by some of my Tasmanian colleagues, declared Burnie on the northwest coast a city during her trip, her visit in 1988. Um, and as it was noted, Burnie were very keen for that to occur with Devonport, their rival city on the northwest coast of Tasmania, having been declared a city by now King Charles III in 1981. It is also worth noting that during her stay in Midlands that was mentioned by Senator Askew shortly, um, the Midlands grazing property uh, Conneville during her 1954 visit, that a special room was built to house the cable link back to Buckingham Palace to house the wireless operators. Her Majesty was connected well before it became such an indispensable part of all of our lives. It is interesting to reflect on how some see her place as one of hierarchy, yet she saw her place as one of service. Her, her enrolment in the Defence Force during World War II is a clear reflection of that. And perhaps that's why she is so widely respected and why we have seen the most extraordinary public display of mourning over the past two, two weeks the likes of which we are unlikely to see again. Those two weeks, and I am sure in the weeks and months to come, will show us how Her Majesty, even after her passing, was demonstrating her pledge to duty. Knowing her intimate involvement in the planning of her funeral, we see the clear demonstration of her understanding of the importance of traditions and ceremony in our lives and all our cultures, in how we tell our stories and how we celebrate and sustain our cultures. Regardless of where they der derive from, Her, understand, her Majesty understood that and it was on display right up until the moment her casket descended into the crypt of St George's Chapel. She gave even past the end. While some might reflect on what they perceive she took, it is clear that on balance, of all things, she gave so much more. Her Majesty said in 1974, perhaps we make too much of what is wrong and too little of what is right. The trouble with gloom is that it feeds upon itself and depression causes more depression. A pertinent quote, I think, in our current times. Her Majesty clearly understood the frailty of both peace and democracy and although it may have slipped under the radar a little, the day after her death was in fact international, the International Day of Democracy. Further pause for reflection on the contribution that the, the Queen Elizabeth uh, and the monarchy's contribution to democracy has made to our system of government, the Westminster system, that despite its flaws is clearly the best there is and gives us all of the freedoms 
that we enjoy in this great country today. The lessons of the last two weeks should not be forgotten as we contemplate the future of our democracy, including the seamless transition to King Charles III, who during the ten days of those events took on that mantle of service which saw him and his family mourning in the full public eye. I had the opportunity to attend a gathering of young Tasmanians during his tour to Tasmania in the late 1970s, a reception for young Tasmanians with the opportunity to meet the then Prince of Wales. Well, despite my steely blue eyes and snappy three-piece suit and luxuriant mullet, the good burghers of Hobart decided that there was a much more attractive person in the room that should meet the then single Prince Charles. So my ambitions were duly, um, the, the crowd was duly parted to give effect to that meeting and not to me. To King Charles and his family, and all those who hold the Majest Her Majesty so dear, I offer my sincerest condolences. To Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, thank you, ma'am, for your service, and may you rest in peace. Senator McGrath. Thank you. I shall be as brief as the Queen's reign was long. On behalf of our, my state, Queensland, and my fellow Queenslanders, I express my condolence to the family of our late Queen. While Australia lost our head of state, a family lost their mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. Our gratitude masks their sorrow. We give thanks for a life of service a life of helping, a life of leading by example. As the nations of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth mourn a much-loved monarch, we have seen the best of people, indeed the best of life. Long, meandering queues, queues peaceful as they are good-humoured, glorious pageantry, a living history as traditional as it was moving, 15 prime ministers from Winston Churchill to Liz Truss, a reign where in 1952 the great officers of state were all held by white men under Winston Churchill, a conservative, to 2022 where none of the great officers of state are held by a white male under Liz Truss, a conservative. A reign from the dour deprivations of post-war Britain to the exuberance of cool Britannia. A gentle hand that guided the end of an empire to the birth of the Commonwealth. The calmness of serving God, country and Commonwealth. Service in life, hope in death, leaving the world a better place. You can't argue with that. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. Senator McLaughlin. It is with great sadness that I join my fellow senators in mourning the death of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of all South Australians, I thank the Queen for her service to the Crown and her extraordinary dedication to our nation. Our late Queen was an example to us all. I honour her life of service. Her reign will serve as a constant reminder to all of us in this place what it means to serve our communities above self. As we reflect on her life, we should follow her lead and aspire to engage with each other on the issues of the day in a more respectful manner. As a volunteer for St John Ambulance and president of its operations branch in South Australia, I also know that every member of St John is greatly saddened by the loss of their sovereign head. The Order of St John is one of the world's longest established charities and traces its origins back over 900 years. As a commander in the Order, I know firsthand the keen interest our late sovereign took in the work of St John in providing care to those in need. As an army officer, I have sought to serve her at home and in the shadow of our enemies in Afghanistan to the best of my abilities. The Queen held a deep Christian faith. She was the supreme governor of the church whose faith I practice, and she lived out that faith every day of her life. The life of Jesus Christ was an inspiration and an anchor for our late Queen and taught her to respect and value all people of whatever faith. She sought a society where liberty and tolerance were paramount. 
Like so many others, I drew inspiration from the way she lived, her life and her unwavering devotion to her duties, never faltering in her trust in God. My thoughts and prayers are with our King and the royal family. I extend to them my deepest sympathies for their great loss. Our new King takes up a heavy burden, but I am in no doubt he will sustain it. On behalf of the people of South Australia, I wish His Majesty a long and happy reign. Senator Hughes. Madam Acting Deputy President, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, said at the Queen Elizabeth's funeral, Christian hope means certain expectation of something not yet seen. We can all share the Queen's hope, which in life and death inspired her servant leadership. Service in life, hope in death, all who follow the Queen's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can, with her, say, we will meet again. The last words drawn from the classic Vera Lynn song. And meet again they shall. The original Fab Four, if you will. The Queen's father, George VI. Her mother, the Queen Mother. And sister, Princess Margaret. A family united by an unexpected abdication are reunited, along with a husband and partner who has waited 17 months to be joined by his wife. The Duke of Edinburgh is joined now by his wife of 74 years in the King George VI Memorial Chapel. On Monday this week, we saw world leaders gather from every political and economic persuasion those who fervently believe in monarchy, those who advocate for their abolition. They all took their seats to pay their respect to this remarkable leader, remarkable sovereign, remarkable woman. Even before becoming queen during World War II, her and her sister, Princess Margaret, broadcast on the Children's Hour on the BBC offering words of encouragement to children separated from their families during the war, just as they had been. Princess Elizabeth became the first woman in the royal family to become an active member of the British Armed Forces, driving and servicing lorries. Becoming Queen at just 25, Her, um, Her Majesty undertook 16 royal tours of Australia. Queen Elizabeth travelled far and wide visiting 117 different countries throughout her reign, every Commonwealth country as well as many more, carrying out 290 state visits since her ascension to the throne in 1952. Not only did Queen Elizabeth live a rich life serving our country and the Commonwealth, she was a devoted wife, mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, all who will miss her dearly. We all will. Her son, now King Charles III, spent what he calls the happiest year of his education at Timbertops in Geelong. So I guess we know who he's likely to be supporting in tomorrow's AFL Grand Final. And I especially look forward to the new Prince and Princess of Wales visiting Australia in the near future. And I personally also hope that they do bring Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis with them. At times, in all families, there are ups and downs, challenges, yet regardless of those moments, some we've now learnt greatly upset the Queen in her last few months, she always maintained grace, dignity and, above all else, a sense of humour. We, of course, all cannot forget Her Majesty jumping from a helicopter with James Bond for the Olympics or pulling a marmalade sandwich from her handbag whilst having tea with Paddington Bear for her Platinum Jubilee, which was my favourite, until I heard the story from Richard Griffith, one of her security guards. The story when the two of them were out walking near Balmoral, when they came across two Americans on a walking holiday. As what the Queen was wont to do, they started up a conversation. However, these Americans did not recognise the Queen. And as they started chatting, the Americans asked the Queen, was she local? To which she replied, no, I live in London, but I have a holiday home here. I've been coming to the holiday home since I was a little girl, well over 80 years. 
In awe of this, the Americans said, wow, if you've been coming here this long, you must have met the Queen. To this, the Queen, quick as a whip, replied, no, but the Queen regularly briefs Dick here. And turning to Richard, they ask him, what's the Queen like? And understanding her humour well, he responds, well, she can be quite cantankerous, but she has a wonderful sense of humour. As quick as can be imagined, the Queen has the American's camera in her hands and they have their arms around Richard having a photo taken. They do manage to get a photo taken with the Queen, however they are still unaware of who they've had their photo taken with. And as they say their farewells and walk away, the Queen turns to Richard and remarks, I would so like to be there when they show their friends these photos and I do hope someone finally recognises me and points out who I am. There is so much more to remember, if not at least all of her hats and handbags. She truly was the master of block outfits and not afraid of colour, but ultimately it cannot be said better than in the words of Paddington Bear. Thank you, ma'am, for everything. Long live the King. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Acting Madam, our Deputy President. Until two weeks ago, waking up to the sad news of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, she was the only monarch I had ever known and ever lived under. Coming from the Hunter, an area largely occupied by descendants of British citizens who came to mine and are generally socially conservative, it was felt almost hoped she would reign forever. Indeed, amongst the hundred strong Welsh community that includes my wife, a sense of pride exists of Her Majesty's choice of pet, with corgis coming from Wales, and indeed the name originating from the Welsh words cor and chi, meaning dwarf and dog. Her Majesty was a constant, a stable point in the world of turbulence, whose actions, or indeed sometimes planned lack of them, gave an example of what the definition of servant leadership should be. There are many stories, many stories, of her time and service being given in this place today. And so I thought I would use my time to talk about her involvement in my region, my home and some small stories. Her Majesty visited the Hunter four times during her reign, starting with stepping off the train with the Duke of Edinburgh at Newcastle Railway Station in February 1954. With an estimated 300,000 people from around the region uh, seeing on that trip, which is amazing seeing the Hunter only had a population of 147,000. Their uh, trip included um, my mother and father taking part of the 44,000 school children taken to the, Royal show, uh, to the showgrounds to see her. Indeed, my father has just told me this morning that he picked some grass that the Royal Land Rover had driven across as a keepsake. She came back in 1970, 1977 and finally 1988 as part of the Bicentennial Tour. In those visits, she encapsulated so much now that is important to the hunter. She opened the first stage of the International Sports Centre, now known as McDonald Jones Stadium, home to the Newcastle Jets and Newcastle Knights. She visited the now lost industries of the BHP steel plant, the state dockyard, and had the Royal Motor Yacht Britannia moored in our port of Newcastle. She opened the Newcastle Region Art Gallery, the Regional Museum, and more importantly, some might say, the Queen's Wharf development, now home to the Queen's Wharf Brewery, the starting place for many a night out. But it is a visit she never made to the area that shows the care she had for my home region in the Hunter. A former Lord Mayor of Newcastle, Mr John McNaughton, often catches up with his neighbour, Adrian Roach, who works in my office, and has told him over the back fence many proud stories of his two royal interactions. Mr McNaughton famously made the papers recently for his story about tearing his pants open on the bumper of his mayoral car whilst entertaining the Queen in 1988, but this story of his second interaction has been kept quiet. After the 1989 earthquake, the Queen sent her son, Prince Edward, to look at the damage and the opportunities for reconstruction in the town. He visited the town, the hospital, spoke to survivors 
and relatives of those lost. It was appreciated at the time as a show of support, and he was to return home with a briefing for Her Majesty. Two years later, at the opening of New South Wales' 50th Parliament by Her Majesty, she saw the Newcastle Mayor across the room, and she made her way to him, through the crowd, singling him out, greeting him warmly, and then discussing the damage and the reconstruction of Newcastle in astonishing detail. This shows that her actions at the time were not for show, but they were for real. Her care for her subjects in the Hunter was such that two years after the incident, her knowledge and understanding were still fresh. Just as she meant something to us, we meant something to her. To Her Majesty, thank you for your service. To her family, my feelings are with you and thank you for sharing your mum, your grandmother, your great-grandmother with the people of the Hunter and the people of Australia. May she rest now in peace with the knowledge that she leaves this earth a better place for having been our Queen. Long live the King. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Senator Napajimpa Price. Acting Madam President, on behalf of Territorians, I rise to pay my respects to, rem uh, to a remarkable elder, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and to offer my condolences to the royal family. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II touched the lives of so many wherever she went. Many respected and admired her as they would a mother or a grandmother. I held great admiration for her as a woman who, at just 25, loyally bestowed upon the Commonwealth her life in service. I could only imagine but never truly comprehend such immeasurable responsibility at such a young age. Growing up in Australia, it has always been my experience and deeply held belief that we are a lucky nation. We have the freedom to become who we want to become because the opportunities exist for us to make this happen. I have witnessed at many citizenship ceremonies the gratitude and love for our nation from our newest citizens. They made Australia their home, the place to raise their families and the land to make their dreams become reality. The way they feel about our great land is the same way I feel. We would not be the nation we are today if it wasn't for the support, devotedness and guidance of the monarchy under Queen Elizabeth's reign. The Westminster system bequeathed to us has served Australia well. While we are still a young nation, having first been federated in 1901 but acquainted with British settlers in 1788, we have been building together for 250 years. Yes, like every nation around the globe, our history features dark and shameful incidents. We must never shy away from acknowledging these, as they are part of our identity. But equally, we must also recognise the good our nation has experienced and grown from. There is much to celebrate from our worthy efforts to strive to better the lives of all Australians. History cannot be undone, and the inevitable inquiring explorations of mankind has meant all corners of the earth have been settled. This landmass we call home was never going to be left untouched by anyone other than our first peoples. We can be grateful that it was in fact the British who settled here before the many other possible colonists. Queen Elizabeth II held the highest position of head of state. There is no higher. She inherited the responsibility of our nation. She was not born to take the throne, yet became the Commonwealth's longest serving monarch. As we know, she served us with grace, fairness and thoughtfulness. During her reign, the Queen had a long-standing connection to the Northern Territory and Central Australia, which she referred to as the living heart of the nation. 
This connection was strengthened by her relationship with our renowned Western Aranda landscape artist, Albert Namajira. It was during her coronation tour of 1954 that Her Majesty first met Namajira when he travelled to Canberra to greet and present her with his artwork. Just the year before, he had been awarded the Queen's Coronation Medal in honour of his remarkable art. Queen Elizabeth had become a Namajira enthusiast and since first being presented with his artwork, built a collection now belonging to the royal family. It's been said that it was this special relationship between Albert and Queen Elizabeth that not only led to his granting of citizenship, but paved the way for citizenship to eventually be granted to all Aboriginal Australians. Namajira was a man before his time, as Queen Elizabeth was a woman before hers. To me, they represented an endearing example of the coming together of two very different worlds, a moment in our nation's history to hold on to. Though sadly Australia lost a venerated national icon before his time, Namajira's connection with the Queen and the royal family continued through his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In 2013, 60 years after Albert and the Queen's first meeting, his grandchildren, Lini and Kevin Namajira, were delighted to have a private audience with Her Majesty. At the time, Lini said, I'm happy to see Her Majesty the Queen. I've come a long way, all the way from Australia, to meet her and represent my family and our community. And in Kevin Namajira's words, I'm a little bit nervous, but I am proud. I'm going to give Her Majesty a painting like my grandfather did. More recently, the Queen has been depicted by Albert's great-grandson and Archibald Prize winner, Vincent Namajira, many times. He was shocked to learn of her passing and when asked if he would continue painting Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, his response was, I might retire from painting the Queen, let her rest in peace, the poor thing, but I'll definitely be busy painting King Charles. Thank you to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As Vincent said, may you rest in peace. Long live the King. Thank you, Senator Nambadjipa Price. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to a truly remarkable woman, a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, the head of the Church of England, a monarch and head of state of 16 nations. For most Australians, the only head of state we've ever known, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of Australia. We've been blessed to have had a Queen and Head of State who carried out her duty for 70 years with the stoicism and good nature that endeared her to so many. The affection and respect in which Her Majesty was held by so many Australians has been evident in the days since her death. And I know I speak on behalf of many Australians when I extend my deepest condolences to His Majesty, King Charles III, the Queen Consort, the Prince and Princess of Wales and the extended royal family at what must be an incredibly sad and tumultuous time as they adapt to a life without their great matriarch. I myself never had the fortune of meeting Her Majesty during her last visit to Tasmania. I was still in primary school, but in the past weeks I've spent some time paging through the history books, looking over photos and footage of the Queen's visits to Tasmania, including her first visit in 1954, just a year after her coronation. There is no mistaking the excitement of the crowd in their cheers and waves. You cannot help but smile to yourself when you see the expression on the faces of the children who were fortunate to meet the Queen, nor could you miss the genuine pleasure on Her Majesty's face at receiving such a warm welcome. Across seven separate visits to Tasmania during her reign, the Queen saw much of our state and met many thousands of our people. She attended school athletics carnivals, opened hospital wards and museums, and even visited apple orchards in the Huon Valley where I grew up, accompanied invariably, of course, by the Duke of Edinburgh, her husband of 74 years, her strength and stay. 
In 1954, on her first visit, she attended memorial services for Tasmania's war dead, laying a wreath with the Duke of Edinburgh at the Hobart Cenotaph and planting a tree on the Queen's domain. Watching footage of this event, the importance of this tribute from the Queen for a population which lived through the horrors of World War II was striking. As the commentary on the newsreel footage from 1954 said, for the men and women who have spent a large portion of their lives on the fronts of war, the presence of Her Majesty was a splendid occasion. We cannot underestimate the significance of the Queen, the first female royal to join the armed services as a full-time active member, honouring their courage and their sacrifice and paying her respects to the fallen. Australia's admiration for the Queen has spanned across generations. Under her reign, decades passed, the 20th century finished, a new millennium began. And as the length of her reign grew, so too did our respect for a woman who devoted her life to a duty which was incessant and all-consuming, but which she nevertheless carried out without complaint for just over seven decades. Since her passing was announced in Australia early on the morning of Friday the 9th of September in our time, like so many in our community, I have reflected on Her Majesty's unparalleled life of service and what it meant that she was our Queen, my Queen. She was only 25 years old when she ascended the throne. She had been married less than five years and had a young family. Her father, King George VI, was only 56 when he died, leaving her the throne much earlier than anyone could have anticipated. While the then Princess Elizabeth undoubtedly had come to terms with the duty she would one day undertake as monarch, it is hard to imagine that she had no regard for the sacrifice that she was making in having to take on the role at such a young age, both for herself and for her family. We ought to remember that this was 1952, where working mothers were nowhere near as commonplace as they are now. Yet in the new Queen, the world had an admirable example of a woman devoted not just to her family, but also to her role, her role as sovereign, because duty demanded it of her. And she did so without complaining. She just got on with the job. This is an example of almost unparalleled commitment for which we should all be grateful as an act of service to our nation and the Commonwealth. But this is also an example of selfless dedication to which all of us in public life should aspire. Throughout her 70 years as monarch, Her Majesty rarely had a day off, was fiercely devoted to her many patronages and charities, and never lost sight of the fact that her relationship with her people was not that of their commander, but rather that of their servant. Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, will be sadly missed by millions of Australians, but so too will she be remembered for her wisdom, her grace and compassion, and for her tireless service to our Commonwealth and to the people of our great nation. Vale Regina, long live the King. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Will I rise to make a contribution in this condolence motion? And it's hard to imagine that we will be again uh, paying tribute to such extensive public service. And we are, as representatives and uh, servants of the people, uh, in that business. We're in the business of public service. And it is, as I say, very difficult to imagine that anyone else could provide that length of high quality service over such an extended period of time. Um, it, it is, uh, uh, in my view, a symbol of democracy and liberal democracy that the Queen exhibited that is the most important reflection. Um, there are many different forms of government uh, that could have been put in place on this continent and in the territories of Australia. And I think we are very fortunate to have been able to be the beneficiaries of the British system. And of course, it is important to separate the personal from the institution. And there are many people uh, that we represent here in this place that are feeling a personal sense of loss 
because of the death of the monarch. And I understand that. I understand how people feel that way uh, because this is a person that has been selfless. It was never about her. It was always about the service that she was rendering to the people that she lived close to, but also the people that lived well beyond her own shores. Now, um, as I say, the institution that she represented uh, and showed such extraordinary continuity um, is a system which has been the bedrock of our success here in Australia over these past couple of hundred years. Now, I know that many other people want to raise issues at this point in time. This is a condolence motion, and I think that people should reflect very carefully on the purpose of this motion. Um, having said that, there are issues that do, do need to be discussed at a later stage. But I would say that um, people would, would do well to consider carefully that the issues that often cause the most rancour here are issues that have been uh, most heavily impacted or influenced by Australians. Uh, we are a sovereign nation. We are a nation which has been in control of our own destiny for many, many years and decades. And if people want to talk about policy issues, then they ought to raise those issues in connection with the Australians that have put in place those policies. So in, in keeping with this condolence motion, I think it is appropriate that we have paused today to reflect upon great service uh, by a remarkable person. And I know that the people that have sent us here to this place uh, are very grateful for the service rendered by this individual, but also for the system of government that we enjoy in this remarkable country. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to offer my condolences to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. For 70 years, she has reigned as our head of state, the longest serving monarch in British history. Globally, she's being remembered for her dedication to duty, service, but also change. She championed change, not just for the sake of change, but to make the world a better place. Becoming queen at 25, she stood as a proud symbol of the stability in her long reign. She witnessed world wars and provided a source of strength and stability as governments came and went. Queen Elizabeth truly served as a monarch that guided the world to become a better place. A crucial aspect that has been overlooked is how the Queen presided over one of the greatest periods of decolonisation the globe has ever seen. Despite many in this chamber looking to wash over this history, it was under the Queen's reign that decolonisation was accelerated, which is something that we should all celebrate. What was most impressive about her reign what was her dedication to duty and service, providing an example, I think, to all of us that serve of what a life of service means. This commitment extended to before her reign as Queen, when she joined the Auxiliary Ter Territorial Service, the women's branch of the British Army, in 1945, learning to become a car mechanic and becoming the first woman in, a royal, in the royal family to join the armed services as an active member. I believe that the Queen recognised and loved Australia for what it is, a harsh land on the other side of the world whose secret ingredient to success is its people. At the opening of the New South Wales Parliament in 1992, the Queen stated, and I quote, the problems in this country have been compounded by severe drought and more recently by flooding. The qualities of the Australian people and the resources of the Australian continent, however, continue to hold abundant promise even in the face of such economic and climactic adversity. It is notable that the Queen said this 
reflecting Dorothy McKellar's words earlier in the century, said this and that we are now facing similar environmental conditions which some are now looking to exploit for their own political agenda. However, I think it was her words to, to this Parliament House in 2011 that strike the truest chord and highlight her true understanding of Australia as a nation. And again, I quote, ever since I first came here in 1954, I've watched Australia grow and develop at an extraordinary rate. This country has made, a, has made dramatic progress economically, in social, scientific and industrial endeavours, and above all, in self-confidence. As leaders, we must recognise these words for what they are, an assessment of where, we've, of where we have come from and a hope of where we will go. Australia and Australians have so much potential uh, as, and have demonstrated the ability to be global leaders. The Queen recognised this back when she first visited in 1954, and it is up to us as parliamentarians to ensure that we live up to this ex expectation and ensure Australia lives up to the Queen's hopes and aspirations for us. Vale, Your Royal Majesty, and long live the King. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Rennick. Queen Elizabeth II was the embodiment, embodiment of dignity and poise. She was undoubtedly the greatest statesman of a generation. The Queen was able to project her leadership not through the overuse of emotions or self-righteous preaching, but by grace, humility and a genuine empathy for the lives of everyday people. There seemed to be few people, if any, who, upon meeting the Queen, were not impressed by her. And so they should be. For her demeanour of the Queen, for the, for the demeanour of the Queen, harks back to an era, especially during the Second World War, of a time when people would persevere with a stoic resolve in the face of hardship and misfortune. The Queen's life of service, like our forefathers, demonstrate the value of hard work, the importance of self-discipline, and the self-confidence and reward that can come from perseverance. In a world of overexposed celebrities and social media trolls, the Queen's capacity for restraint in regard to commentary offers a masterclass to all of us as, how, as to how we can influence others in a respectful and positive manner. While it is easy to scorn the pomp and ceremony, it sends a message that Western liberal democracy should take very seriously. Traditions and the precision and discipline that come with them are a reminder of the sacrifices made by our forefathers, for which we should always be grateful. In the debate about whether Australia should become a republic, it is often overlooked that in a true democracy power comes from the people and not from the head of state. Queen Elizabeth II understood the importance of elected representation very well. Indeed, she encapsulated the true meaning of democracy and her feelings for Australia in her speech at the opening of Parliament House in 1988, when she said, and I quote, Parliamentary democracy is a compelling ideal, but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed, and it is only too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and of their elected representatives to make it work. The earliest free settlers brought their ideals of a democratic society with them and succeeding generations of Australians have inherited those principles and put them to work in what we know as the parliamentary system. Commitment to parliamentary democracy lies at the heart of the nation's maturity, tolerance and humanity. This is surely one of the characteristics that has attracted so many people to come to Australia from countries which do not enjoy the benefits of the parliamentary system in such large measure." End of quote. Ultimately, sovereignty isn't about who our head of state is, but whether Australia as a country can defend itself, feed itself and provide its people with gainful employment. If there is to be a debate about our government in this country, it needs to focus on the dysfunctional relationship between our state and federal governments. Australia is not served well by our current federation, where the ambiguous responsibilities between those governments are damaging the welfare of the Australian people. Australia does not need to entertain a symbolic debate about a ceremonial head of state while our health system and many other essential services are falling apart. 
there are much more important issues that governments should be dealing with. The Queen's passing also reminds us that we have much to be thankful when it comes to our British heritage. Despite its imperfections, British institutions, ideas and literature have been a hugely positive contributor to human welfare. Australia undoubtedly owes its early success to the systems introduced by the British. All races have been colonised or done the colonising. The British Empire, like any empire, doesn't have a monopoly on wrongdoings and nor should its descendants carry any guilt about those wrongdoings. Let us not forget that Britain passed the Slavery Abolition Act, the first act of any parliament in the world that abolished slavery in their colonies. The Queen was the last of her generation, a leader that throughout her reign touched the lives of so many people across the global community of nations. She will be remembered for her humility, dignity and composure. She set a standard of leadership by which the world and national leaders measure themselves by, a standard that will stand for centuries to come. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Dean Smith. Senators, we have witnessed a remarkable reign, <clears throat> historic in its length, notable for its grace and nobility. Fifteen days ago, we were met with the saddest of news, the passing of our late monarch, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It's been a time of conflicting emotions, profound grief for our loss, but an equal measure of gratitude for her love and service, given until the very end of her life. Her presence gifted us with familiarity in, and unity in good times and bad. Our Queen believed in our community and common decency, which mirrored her own. Above all else, she embodied devotion to service above self. It was the living fulfilment of a promise made to the Commonwealth in 1947 and mentioned many times today. At a service to celebrate the Queen's life in Perth St George's Cathedral this week, it was highlighted that the promise concluded with the prayerful commitment, God help me to make good my vow. There is no doubt that is exactly what happened. Queen Elizabeth II was not a queen above us, but a queen among us. From the moment she set foot on Australian soil in February 1954, a lifelong bond was formed. In his hope, opening to these condolences, Senator Farrell noted that Her Majesty liked and trusted us. We liked and trusted her too. And her death has been greatly felt in my home state of Western Australia. The Queen visited Australia 16 times during her 70 years on the throne. Seven of those visits included Western Australia. The late Queen's visit coincided with a polio outbreak in Perth. Like the recent pandemic, it required enforced social distancing. Events were cancelled or held outdoors, and the shaking of hands was forbidden. But the Queen came, and West Australians loved her for it. She visited Western Australia again in 1963, 1974, 1981, 1988, 1992 and 2000, and she was warmly received on each occasion. In October 2011, aged 85, and having just attended the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth, the Queen was hosted by almost 120,000 West Australians at the Great Aussie Barbecue on Perth's Esplanade. The enjoyment of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh was palpable. It was that occasion in Perth, a grand and warm farewell, that marked her last day in Western Australia and Australia. The West Australian newspaper has given West Australians an opportunity to express in their own words tributes to our Queen this week. Anne Jones wrote, a very special lady who did her duty right to the end as she always said she would. Rest in peace, 
with your prince. And Margaret Forbes shared, remembering an amazing human being who, throughout her long life, was true to the promise she made as a young woman, she served with grace and dignity. They are emblematic of the affections held by many, many West Australians. <clears throat> as the good book tells us, there is a time to mourn and a time to dance. Our sorrow now gives way to optimism and eventually celebration. In London and then here in Canberra, we witness the proclamation of a new sovereign, His Majesty King Charles III. We look forward to the coronation of he and the Queen Consort. The new king's great strength, in addition to his personal qualities, is his unmatched apprenticeship for this role. We have seen and respected the way he and his wife took on many of Queen Elizabeth's duties in recent months and the support they gave her following the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Over time, he will no doubt successfully marry the well-established traditions of his mother with his own style. The new king will be a king for our times in the same way the queen was for hers. To borrow some lines from a famous anthem, thy choicest gifts in store, on him be pleased poor. The long reign, even the passing of our late queen, has showcased the virtues of constitutional monarchy. It is marked here by a distinctly Australian character, and it will be its Australian characteristics that will stain it for many years to come. The Crown continues to evolve in a way that keeps it central to our lives. I believe, for example, that it can be a conduit through which greater reconciliation can be achieved, rather than a barrier to it. Above all, constitutional monarchy matters not because of the power it wields, but the power that it denies. As she sailed away from Fremantle in the Royal Yacht Gothic at the end of her 1954 tour, the Queen broadcast a message to Australians in which she said, it is demonstrated that the Crown is a human link between all the people who owe allegiance to me and allegiance of mutual love and respect and never of compulsion. This is what it was. This is what it remained for seven decades. Our late Queen would be humbled and deeply appreciative of our mourning for the end of her reign. But she put enormous value on the power and stability of continuity. She would expect us to embrace this new era and all it promises with confidence and faith. So may God save the king. Thank you, Senator Smith. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify the assent to the motion. Senators. I call Senator Farrell. Oh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, th thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the days of meeting of the Senate. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate meet from the 26th to the 28th of September 2022. So the question is, um, Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. I move that the motion be amended to also include Thursday, the 29th of September, 2022, as a sitting day. Uh, thank you. So the question is that um, are you seeking are you seeking leave, Senator Gallagher? Just to speak to the amendment. Is leave granted? Being I don't think I need leave. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, Sorry. Uh, thank you. I just want to speak briefly to the amendment. Yeah. The government won't be supporting Senator Pocock's amendment, um, and um, we have reached agreement with senators around the days of sitting next week. It is because of the um, passing of Her Majesty the Queen 
had required us to move a sitting week. It is in the school holidays, um, and um, I think we have tried to be as reasonably can, balancing up people's travel, previous arrangements, and the need to care for others during that time to manage the program in accordance with those responsibilities. Thank you, Senator. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. If, if I may speak to my amendment. Yes. I understand we've had a period of mourning, but we've also lost an entire day of um, Senate business. Propose that we make that up. There's some incredibly important pieces of legislation before us, including territory rights, which I fear may continue to drag out for the rest of the year. I think it's really important that senators actually have an opportunity to speak to it and then we do bring it to a vote. This is an incredibly important matter to many people living in the territories. And on a broader note of, of how much the Senate will actually consider legislation this year, by my calculation it's 29 days. If you compare that to New Zealand, who is sitting for 90 days this year, or Canada, 120 days. I don't feel like the extra day is a, is a huge imposition, uh, given some of the really important uh, legislation that's before us. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. I rise to speak on uh, the amendment and the substantial motion before us. Um, I understand the points that Senator Pocock is making. Um, however, at this time, uh, members in this place, and my Greens colleagues in particular have made arrangements on the basis of, of what had previously been agreed, so we will stick to that. However, I do want to um, indicate that we do think that we need to find time to deal with the uh, Territories uh, Legislation Bill in particular and to not allow this to slide off into the never-never. That may suit some in this place, uh, but it uh, certainly doesn't suit all. So, um, we will um, be prepared to speak um, collectively across this chamber to find time to deal with that. Um, and I would also indicate that there is a lot on our agenda uh, for this next three days as now nominated by the government, and I would ask us perhaps to be as efficient as possible in dealing with the long list of things that has been circulated by the government. And it may mean that we need to uh, extend hours on some of those days in order to get the work done. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Birmingham. President, uh, I acknowledge the government's uh, consultation with the opposition in relation to the scheduling of these additional sitting days as replacement days uh, for those that were cancelled following the death of Her Majesty. Uh, given that consultation and engagement the government undertook, uh, the opposition uh, will not be supporting the amendment and respects the government's uh, scheduling of the sitting days. Uh, of course, it is for the government to then ensure that uh, those sitting days and its scheduling uh, make most effective use of, uh, of their legislative program and that their program can work within the sitting days as, uh, uh, as they have proposed. Thank you, Senator. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. So we now move to the substantive motion as moved by Senator Gallagher. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher relating to sitting dates be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Um, am I calling Senator Gallagher? Thank you, President. I move that as a mark of respect to the memory of Her Late Majesty, the Senate do now adjourn. And meet again. Okay. Uh, thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So um, the Senate now stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday the 29th of September at 10am. Thank you, Senators.